This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Good morning. It's three minutes after ten. I hope you're well. Do you want the good news or the bad news? But there isn't any bad news. That's the good news. No, I'm, I will not be dedicating an hour of today's programme to the trials and tribulations of my travel to work. Uh, everything is tickety-boo, back to normal, and uh, running like clockwork, uh, as much as one can expect in the circumstances. So uh, so apologies if you are expecting an update on, on yesterday's adventures. Uh, uh, everything is, is normal. Um, and and th- possibly because the news is not... Or, or we are not groaning under the weight of breaking news. The new year is is getting to a, 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 a slowish start. I, I appreciate that attention on the continuing bombardment in Gaza. I don't know if you've seen the story of the Al Jazeera journalist who's now lost three children, three of his own sons, and continues to do his best to report on what is happening there. So when I say to you that the news agenda is is a bit slow, don't bombard me with messages reminding me of, of what is going on elsewhere in the world. I, I know about that, and we will return to that territory, but, but we can't... We can't cover it every day for, for, for obvious reasons. And and front pages still. There's two things. Does this, are you okay? Are you up for this? I, I, I sort of feel that we're having a pre-show meeting together. I can't, I, the Prince Andrew story, sorry, the Andrew Windsor story um, dominates some of the front pages. Fresh embarrassment after claims he was involved in a sex tape resurfaced in uh, American court papers. Um, other Other public figures caught in the in the same crosshairs include Bill Clinton and, and Sir Richard Branson, all of whom, of course, completely deny any inappropriate behaviour. But the, but the release of these papers, and indeed on this occasion some photographs, it's not going anywhere. The Times probably distills down the, the, the two stories of the day. And when I say this is a bit like a pre-show production meeting, <laughs> what I mean is the, um, the, the, the stories that are dominating the news are not necessarily the most fertile territory for our time together in the morning. I can't see a phone-in on Prince Andrew, Andrew Windsor. Can you? I, I just I don't know what it would be. I mean, first of all, he can't libel the man. He denies all wrongdoing, albeit that he paid millions of, of dollars to one of his accusers. The, the, the sense that it's huge and doesn't get the attention it deserves is driven in my per- case, but my very personal case, in large part by continuing befuddlement at the abuse that Prince Harry and his wife receive when his uncle is caught up in a story like this. It is absolutely extraordinary. Meghan Markle's fondness for avocados saw her blamed for world famine, whereas Andrew's involvement with a convicted paedophile and and sex trafficker, and that's not deniable, involvement is a, is a, um, a, a nuanced word, doesn't seem to excite the same levels of scandal among royal correspondents in this country, never mind the great British public. And speaking of the great British public, what's going on with this post office story? Did a cracking job yesterday. So some front pages for you. Fast appeals for wrongly convicted postmasters in the Times. Scramble to clear victims of post office scandal in The Guardian. Fujitsu may be forced to foot bill for post office scandal in the Telegraph. Shameless as national revulsion over post office scandal mounts. Former boss still clings to her CBE um, and Lib Dem leader refuses to step aside. Daily Mail um, calling for Ed Davey to step aside. He certainly has questions to answer, although odd that any news coverage of this would focus uh, on politicians other than the ones who've been in power for the last 14 years. Um, and And I don't know, and pledge to clear names of post office victims at last is on is on the front of the mirror. I don't know quite what is happening here. And I wonder if you fancy trying to help me work it out. As we touched on yesterday, Private Eye, Computer Weekly and the BBC have been chipping away at this story for almost 20 years. A journalist called Nick Wallace almost single-handedly. He's written a book about it called The Great Post Office Scandal. To be fair to the Daily Mail, um, it was serialised in those pages three years ago. But it did not ignite the public interest. It simply didn't catch our imagination. I'm speaking now as a member of the public rather than a member of the media. I... I know that a drama can reach places that a news bulletin cannot. I know it can refresh the parts. 
that a news bulletin simply cannot. But this is now moving into uncharted territory, I would argue. The other examples of something document something dramatic as opposed to documentary driving changes in the news did not sort of dominate news coverage and front pages and headlines for the days now that you can count on this one and and i don't quite know why i don't quite know why and i wonder what you think there is a possibility of course that we are the tail and you are the dog that the media continues to be uh, obsessed with a story that it has known about for the best part of 20 years. And the general public is not enormously engaged. There is a petition calling for Paula Vanell's former head of the post office, to, use, to lose her CBE. And I think over a million people have signed it. But, you know, there, there, there are petitions for just about everything under the sun. Admittedly, they may not have been signed by over a million people, but it doesn't involve an enormous amount of effort or exertion to, to sign a petition. It pops up in your inbox or on your Facebook page. Your Auntie Doris sends it over and asks you to, to sign it. You click on a button and lo and behold, it's signed. So, I mean, do, do you care? Has this really boiled your proverbial? Or is there something else going on? There's that weird bit here about Computer Weekly, Private Eye, the BBC, Nick Wallace, uh, James Arbuthnot, um, the cross-party parliamentary campaign leader, public inquiry underway. The Metropolitan Police have been investigating it for four years. It has been slowly burning now for, as, as, as we've said, for a very, very long time. And then suddenly, post-drama, it is the biggest story in town, by some distance and now for some days. What explains that for you? It cannot simply be the power of the dramatisation, Mr Bates versus the post office. It cannot simply be the performances of Monica Dolan and, and Julie Hesmondhouse and, and Toby Jones. I mean, it's a good drama. I don't think it'll win any BAFTAs. Uh, and yet it continues to drive journalism to places that it hasn't been to before. And yet the Daily Mail is the best-selling newspaper in the country and it serialised a book that gave you chapter and verse on this issue three years ago. And the numbers for the drama are not that high. You know, that no numbers are as high as they used to be. The days of EastEnders getting 20 million viewers when, when Dirty Den fell in the canal or whatever it was, uh, those days are behind us because, obviously, because of proliferation of platforms. Try saying that if you haven't put your teeth in. Proliferation of platforms uh, means that the, the audience is just being spread more thinly, inevitably. And it's done all right, this, this, this show, but it's not rewritten the rule books. It's not Doctor Who. Um, so what is going on? I suppose, in a way, my first question it cancels out my second question. If I'm saying, why is this capturing the mood of the nation in such an extraordinary way? 0345 And then typically, my second question is kind of, is it really? Or is there something else going on? I, I guess that the government... And the, most most of the newspapers, remember, are still in the business of, of pr protecting and defending and helping the government. Uh, unless you're going to launch a sort of unhinged attack on, on parents who are suffering and struggling to get their children to school, who are you actually going to encourage the great British public to hate today? If you're, if you're shilling for the Tories, this is, this is manna from heaven because you can sort of pretend it's got nothing to do with them. I, I saw Farage yesterday trying to blame it all on Keir Starmer which no doubt the Daily Telegraph or the Daily Express will probably pick up and pretend is a news story. So part of the reason why this is getting all the attention, I suspect, is because it doesn't involve making Rishi Sunak or James Cleverley or um, who's, the, who's, the, who's the Home Secretary at the moment? Oh, David Flipping Cameron. Good God, that's like a... Hmm. Well, I don't know what that's like. Banquo's ghost, perhaps. Turn foreign and home. I always get them the wrong way around. It's not like I'm a journalist, you know. Sue me. So I wonder whether part of it is the fact that this is a big story that the newspapers can get their teeth into and throw brickbats and abuse at everyone from Paula Venels to Ed Davey, and it doesn't involve pointing out the misery and chaos that the Conservatives continue to 
preside over. But I don't think it's that. I don't think it's um, it's all of that. Nick Wallace, Mark reminds us. I, I touched on this yesterday. I think he did crowdfund his coverage in the in the High Court. I did. You know, I think I might even have given him a few quid because the editors didn't find it in his words sexy. So it wasn't a sexy story. This is Mark in Staffordshire reminding us. That's the word I think that Nick Wallace used. And yet now, suddenly, it's the sexiest story in town. So I apologise for not having a laser-like focus on the question that I'm going to invite you to answer in a moment. But some days I quite like to be flabby. Some days I quite like to be a, a, a little bit floppy. I quite like a question that leaves you several avenues by which to approach it. And, and the question of what's, what's going on is the one that traditionally yields some of the most interesting answers. So why has a story that has been around for the best part of 20 years, that has been fully reported and revealed, and that has already prompted a metropolitan police investigation and a cross-party parliamentary campaign, why has it captured the imagination of this nation in such an extraordinary and arguably unprecedented way. 03456060973. And of course, the second story, the second question then becomes, is it actually, does it actually involve factors other than the story itself? Is, is, is there a sort of a lining of the planets going on here? You know, there's not a lot else to talk about. If, 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 if there was, then maybe this would have been pushed off the front pages. But at the moment, the only thing coming close to pushing it off the front pages are yet more revelations about Andrew Windsor's involvement with a convicted sex trafficker. But remember, it's Prince Harry that's the, that's the wrong one. It's Prince Harry and his wife that are the real problem in the royal family. It's quarter past ten. Shall I open... It's like quarter past a ten. I just sounded like I was doing a, a, a dreadful advert for pasta or something like that. Quarter past a ten. I, I, I'm, shall I open the phone lines now? Have you had enough of my dulcet tones for this morning? If you nod that vigorously, Keith, you might give yourself a, you might do yourself a mischief. 16 minutes after 10 is the time. Here comes the number. 0345 6060 973. And I, I, I leave you with some words from Ben, who's in Exeter. It's heartbreaking, James, the drama, but it's also terrifying. It's a stark reminder of how powerless we, as individuals, can be against an all-powerful machine with unlimited funds like the post office and of how fragile our lives truly are. You know I'm a great believer in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the fragility of stability. One of the great illusions of civilization is that it's permanent. Just have a look at what Donald Trump did in, on January the 6th and, and where he sits now on electoral polls in America, that the idea that stability will always be protected by self-interest is clearly not true. Where, wherever you go in the world or wherever you look in history, you're, 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 a, you're a hair's breadth away from chaos. And uh, maybe that's it. On a personal level, it feels like an anxiety dream. But it's not your anxiety dream, so why are you so bothered by it? James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.19 is the time. Um, not for the first time. I turn to the secret barrister to give you a little insight into, into how Britain works, or indeed how they broke Britain. Although the secret barrister's last book, Stories of the Law and How It's Broken, rather preempted the title of mine. It was in 2014 that the Conservative government changed the law to make it all but impossible for people wrongly convicted and imprisoned to claim compensation. It was Chris Grayling and Theresa May who led the charge to, deply, to deprive wrongly convicted people of compensation, changing the rules so that those people had to effectively prove their innocence, which is, of course, uh, an almost impossible standard to meet. And not for the first time, I heartily recommend The Secret Barrister's book on this subject. And, uh, and I'll retweet the top of the thread explaining it because I don't think that got covered in the drama and you're unlikely to see that being picked up in, uh, in the Daily Telegraph or, or, or elsewhere in the right-wing media. The fact that it was the Ministry of Justice presided over by Chris Grayling and subsequently endorsed by Theresa May, who essentially made it impossible for the kind of wrongly convicted people caught up in the post office scandal to secure the levels of compensation that they so clearly deserve. Um, in 2021, how much money do you think was paid out to miscarriages of justice in total? 
I'll tell you in a minute. But in the meantime, have a guess. Text me. How many? Miscarriages of justice. Given that in the post office scandal alone, 700 people were locked up. How, how many overall, including any miscarriage of justice whatsoever in the country, how many people do you think were paid compensation as a consequence of being mis victims of miscarriages of justice in 2021? I'll tell you in a minute. First, though, Pat's in Bristol to address the question of why this and why now, Pat. Hello, good morning, James. Hello. First, first time talking to you. Absolutely great. What a privilege for me. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, I just think it's come at uh, the darkest time of the year. It's miserable. It's January. It's Christmas is over. Yes. Well and spotted. a huge piece of truth has come out to the general public which has totally reinforced the feeling that Go on. the government doesn't care about the little people. And this, this is government in, gov government in capital letters. It doesn't matter yeah. who it is or who's in power. This just this is yet more proof. Well, it seems to have gone on for such a long time. Yes. I hate to think that you know the, the government that was previous to this had fingers in the pie. Maybe they were busy elsewhere, but... Um, the one that we've had since 2010 seems to have really doubled down on, to use your phrase, double down. Mm. Uh, I didn't know that one until you said it. Really? Uh, yeah. Where have you been? We, we flip oh, heck, it's, not, it's not exactly yeah, a new one. Double we down. We don't things like that down here in Bristol. Do you not? Okay. No. But anyway, we kind of, <laughs> I, I felt the absolute pain and horror of the woman who sat there and watching the amount of shortfall doubling before her very eyes. Yes. And to, to think that, you know, this was sanctioned by, by the government that's supposed well, to look well, I mean, I, we need people. to we, we need to be careful. One, one of the interesting and, and curious things about the post office, and I, I wonder if you can guess two other institutions that have a sort of constitutional right to bring their own prosecutions. RSPCA is one of them. Wow, you're good. And? Well, that's because I did 30 years in the police, so, you know. I oh, do well, all right. Well, you could have told me that. She's 30 <laughs> years in the police. You've never heard the phrase double down before. Well, it's not general parlance. We more like, like grub What about when Fingers McKee, you dragged Fingers McKee in for safe cracking and he gave you a completely dodgy alibi and, and then he insisted that it was true and you didn't say, you're doubling down on that nonsense. You're nicked. Nah. All right. That's, that's, that's drama. That's drama. All right, for the, um, for the win... What's the other one? What's the other institution that can bring private uh, prosecutions? Controversially. Can't now. Come on. Can't come on, try harder, Pat. You can do it. Um, I'll give you a clue. It's strangely relevant to what we're talking about now. What in you revenue. Pardon? In our revenue. I don't know. It's not I mean I don't I don't think they can, but that's not the one I'm thinking of. Last chance. It's strangely relevant to what you just described to me a moment ago. What were you watching? What, what, what were you I'm watching? Too early for what me. were you watching? I'm retired now. What were you watching the drama on? ITV. And what was ITV? Oh, all the television. No, you you yeah. see, look at that. That's why you're not allowed to confer on University Challenge, Pat. <laughs> Gets too Strange, easy. Strange, because the TV licence record office was in Bristol. Right, well, it's no excuse at all for you needing so much help to get to that particular conclusion. But it, it, but it's true. So so I don't. I'm not entirely. You know me, Pat. I'm not exactly backwards in coming forwards when it comes to giving this shower of uh, so-called politicians uh, the, the the kickings and the criticisms they so richly deserve but um i don't i don't know that that the government actually is on the hook for this one which makes the question of why it's captured the public imagination in quite such a spectacular way all the more interesting and and you have to presume that it has excited or piqued the interest of people who haven't watched the drama because the numbers don't don't tally otherwise. What is it about this story and the fact that it's been around for the best part of 20 years that explains this sort of New Year eruption that we're currently still in the middle of? 10.25 is the time. Chris is in Salford. Chris, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. Um, re really interesting, this story, and, and I find it really emotional, actually. I got quite emotional about it watching it on telly because I have actually followed this story for some time. Right. I'm no specialist on any of this stuff. But... <laughs> The, my take on it, rightly or wrongly, is there's a sense of helplessness in the nation at the moment about what's happening. The system's failing, there's inequality, there's inequity, and we can't do anything about it. The legal system isn't working properly, and we can't make a difference. And I think one of the things that I've done, I've, I've signed all the positions that came out for this and yes. followed it and hope that they get some kind of justice. And then when the TV programme came on, I think it, it humanised it, first of all, which I think is the, the thing you mentioned yesterday. But, but I think we see something of a chance here to get justice for people that, that is almost a, a way of us jumping on it 
in in a way of exercising our own sense of injustice. That's so it's really maybe interesting. Personal to these people. Yeah. So I'll give you a little example of Please. mine, and and I was just saying to your producer there that I, I own a business, and I took a business to court. I won in court. I've been very successful with the case. I had to represent myself, but it's yes. cost me a lot of money. Well, there it is. And, and I'm not getting anything out of it. I don't get a penny back. It's just become a point of principle. And as a business person who, in these current climates, you know, all businesses are struggling, it's probably, you know, probably cost me a thick end of seven, eight thousand pounds to, to take a company to court over a 2,500 injustice and it was an injustice and the way they behaved was appalling and the judge knows it and the court knows it but but, the but, but they would that, have got away with it if you didn't have the well, the, the, the way with all with it anyway james right. they're going to get away with it anyway and the reason they're going to get away with it is because they've got no assets everybody works from home now so they don't have buildings anymore they don't have assets well that's not quite true i mean it might be true in the very specific case that you're, in you're the specific yeah, case, yeah, yeah, yeah that you're right. describing so, so, sorry, so you I'm, think I'm, there's I'm a sort of there's a sort of uh, there's an osmosis of of, of of grievance going on here, yeah. and, and we see these people and, and beautifully portrayed and perfectly told as the story is. Yeah. It's yeah. a there but for the grace of God kind of scenario. Well, a little bit of that, and a little bit of I've had that experience, and I never won, but I hope these guys do. Because because of the David and Goliath element of the battle, and the fact that, that on this Absolutely. occasion David just kept chipping and chipping and chipping away until eventually it looked as if. Well, it looks as if Goliath is set to topple, although what that toppling looks like, I, I do not know. Uh, Fujitsu, billions and billions and billions of pounds. I, I, I'm not sure there's a financial penalty that would touch the sides of their profit margins, but it would, of course, compensate the wrongly convicted. And speaking of victims of miscarriages of justice, to answer that previous question, and this question and answer provided by the secret barrister who tweets as at Barrister S and writes brilliant books, um... Not one. Not a single penny was paid out to victims of miscarriages of justice in 2021. Uh, there were 316 applications for it between the scheme's introduction um, up until 2020, of which eight people were awarded compensation. So, listen, I'm not pretending to completely understand the issues involved, have, despite having read the book, but roughly 2014 onwards legislation introduced to make appeal to make receiving compensation for wrongful convictions almost impossible if you want to know why you'd have to ask chris grayling the man who uh presided over the complete collapse of the probation service and subsequently went on to earmark millions of pounds worth of government money for ships that didn't exist you, you you'll remember that of course thank you andrew uh, i beg your pardon thank you chris andrew is in cumbernauld and andrew what would you like to oh no i'll come to you after the news andrew i'll get the hang of this one day Almost 20 years into it and still forget to look at the clock as regularly as I should. We'll come to you first after the headlines. If you want to join in, the question we're asking is quite broad or flabby, if you prefer. It's really a question of why now? 20 years or thereabouts, this story has been unfolding. Computer Weekly, Private Eye, the BBC have all covered it journalistically. Um, Nick Wallace has published a book about it, which was serialised by the Daily Mail. A cross-party parliamentary campaign led by the former Tory minister, James Arbuthnot, now in the House of Lords. A public inquiry already underway and the Metropolitan Police four years into an investigation. But you stick it on the telly with um, a few brilliant actors and suddenly it's not just the biggest story in town, it's the biggest story in town for day after day after day. Tell me why you think that is. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I've, I can feel a new feature coming on. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, what about all the old features that you did for a couple of weeks and then forgot about? And this is a valid point that you raise. Woke Watch should probably have never gone away. Woke Watch worked really well. Everyone liked Woke Watch. And it's got... Well, did I, did, we didn't win, did we? We didn't get rid of people using Woke ignorantly as a pejorative without ever knowing what it means. We just sort of lost interest in it. I say we. I'm, I'm just sort of obliquely criticising my colleagues. Unhinged headline never got off the ground. Do you know why? Because I can't do everything. I can't do the show and also come up with all the ideas. So I come up with the Unhinged Headline of the Day Award, and I expect other people to join in and help me pick Unhinged Headlines, but nope. Uh, so I've got a new idea for a new feature, but I don't know whether it's even worth telling you what it is, because it'll probably just wither, and, and it'll be forgotten by the end of the week. And it can't be daily either, cause, uh, it, but it will get more frequent as, as the year unfolds. And it hasn't got a pithy title. 
I, I listen, I concede the unhinged headline of the day doesn't exactly trip off the tongue, but Woke Watch did. It even had a it even had a funny thing. Have we still got it? Go on. Woke Watch. Yes. So I don't know what we're gonna call this. You can help with that if you want. The um the idea, the desperation on display when right wing client journalists attempt to smear Kia. Smear Kia, that's good. Whoa, oh yes, is that is that all we need? Is that it? Smear Kia. It is, isn't it? Smear Kia. Can we do that in the voice? Will he do that for us? Smear Kia. Do we want that? Do we do that? So what is smear Kia, I hear you say? Well, you've probably worked it out already. It's when pathetic client journalists who wouldn't know integrity or honesty if it sat on their fat heads conjure up stories designed to malign. That rhymes as well, designed to malign. No, smear Kia is still better, isn't it? Smear Kia, designed to malign the Labour leader as the general election which he is currently poised to win looms ever closer. So can you think of some early examples of smear Kia? Of course you can. He bought a field so that his disabled mother could keep donkeys in it. And when he sold it, it was worth more than it was when he bought it. Smear Kia! I think it was the Mail on Sunday that went in hard on that one. How dare, how dare a very successful lawyer spend some of his hard-earned cash on a field for his disabled mother to care for donkeys, distressed donkeys, and then sell it at a later date for more money than he paid for it in the first place. Ha! Huh, calls himself a lefty. What with his field? So that was probably the first example of smear Kier, and that was before the poll lead opened up to anything like the levels that it has subsequently. Perhaps the best example of smear Kier would be the 13 front pages that the Mail dedicated to a curry that he had in uh, a curry that he had in. Um, Durham while campaigning which they were desperately trying to portray as some sort of breach of, of, of Covid rules comparable to the disgraced former Prime Minister Boris Johnson's repeated lies and law breaking 13 front pages pathetic Tory MPs getting involved the police to their eternal shame buckling under the pressure of newspaper bullying and how did it end? Well you know how it ended and you know how he knew it was going to end, because he's a former director of public prosecutions. He kind of understands these matters. And nothing's ever certain, of course, but there was a quiet confidence to the man about where that was going to lead. But it doesn't matter. If you're a client journalist who cares more about sucking up to Tories than telling the truth to your readers, you're going to love that kind of story. Smear Kia. Um, you've, someone suggested Starmer Drama, but Smear Kia is better, isn't it? The ki or Kia Smear. Kia Smear. The Kia Smear. Kia Smear. Smear Kia. All right. So I see you're joining in now, are you? So you'll be coming up with lots of ideas for this new feature, will you? Or just hanging me out, as usual, to do it, to do it all on my own. Um, and today there's a classic. So the Sun newspaper have attempted to smear Kia. That's where, that's where the thing would kick in. So what I'll do when we launch this feature, which I probably will have forgotten about by Friday, I will say... Well, what happens now? Today, the Sun newspaper has attempted to, and then I'll point at Keith, and Keith will press a button, and the voice will go, smear Kia, and then I'll tell you the story. And you probably won't even believe me, because the Daily Telegraph have already tried to do this. Do you remember? Oh, yes, sorry, that's smear Kia number three. The Daily Telegraph found out that when Keir Starmer was a lawyer, he worked as a lawyer. There should really be some music there. It's like a sort of dun, dun, dun. When Keir Starmer was a lawyer, Keir Starmer worked as a lawyer. That was front page news in the Daily Telegraph before Christmas. And today it is the turn of the sun to join in. Um, uh, taking their instructions, as ever, from a Downing Street. I forget which former members or future members of the Sun editorial board are currently on the staff in Downing Street. So hard to keep up. That revolving door spins so quickly. I'm surprised it hasn't taken off. But a truly, I mean, an, a, even by the standards of modern client journalism, a genuinely, a spectacularly ridiculous individual called, called Harry Cole. Um, he has written a story about how Keir Starmer fought against the death penalty. Yeah, no, I know what you're thinking. What's wrong with that? We're, we're against the death penalty in this country. Even the Sun describes itself as being opposed to the death penalty. But no. So what they've done is they found some of the people that would have got the death penalty if Keir Starmer hadn't worked for free, because he saw it as a matter of principle, against the death penalty. And that is what they have turned into a story. 
working on a pro bono case or working on pro bono cases to oppose the death penalty. And so twisted is the sun on this. It's, it's quite special, actually. So twisted is the sun on this that they, they don't realise how stupid they make themselves look because they, they run an op-ed that says, Keir Starmer boasts he stood up for the most vulnerable as a human rights lawyer, except one of those supposedly desperate souls buried his toddler stepson alive. It's a horrible story, but that is what happens when you oppose the death penalty. People who've done disgusting things don't get killed by the state. The Sun struggles to understand this because they write, um, many oppose the death penalty in the UK, the Sun does. To which, if you were as stupid as Harry Cole, or as twisted as the Sun newspaper, you would respond by saying, why does the Sun support Jamie Bulger's killers? Or why is the Sun on the side of Myra Hindley? Or why does the Sun love Peter Sutcliffe so much? Because if you oppose the death penalty, it doesn't mean you approve of or support the crimes committed by people who might have been killed by the state if the death penalty existed. If you oppose the death penalty, you oppose the death penalty. If you're prepared to work for nothing to seek to get rid of the death penalty in this country or other countries, then you are a noble man employing Christian values across the world. So that is why today I think we are going to launch a new feature called Smear Kia. I like that. How long until we get a sound effect, Keith? What? What do you mean don't put shrug at me? I just said, I just literally said I can't do everything myself. I'm not going to make my own jingles. How long? What, a day? Two days? Three days? Okay. End of play today? That, why not? This is the biggest show on the station. I thought that if the news agents asked for this, they'd have had it yesterday. I want a jingle. I want a smear Kia jingle, all right? And I want it now. Honestly. It's not even as if we're having a party to celebrate my 20th anniversary on the station whenever that is. It's crazy. What's the point of having the biggest show on the station if you don't get a big party when it's your 20th anniversary? We could get a load of celebrities to ring in and congratulate me, like Sue Pollard. That would be good, wouldn't it? Sue Pollard. Is Davro still around? Davro would be good. Get Davro, Pollard, all the biggies. Paul Chuckle. He'd be good. Congratulations, James, on your 20th anniversary. Uh, 10.41 is the time. Back to the major story under discussion, which is, of course, the post office scandal and why it has captured the imagination of people. Andrew and Cobbenard, I owe you an apology, don't I, really? Not really, no. No, no I, I do. Because you I did, were there. I to, Go on. I did try to get through to you once, and I sat in a queue, and... Uh, and never got anywhere. Something else took over, and that was that. And, and there, there you were. Before the news, I said I'll come to Andrew soon. And then I went off on a completely self-indulgent and largely ridiculous tirade about a new feature and my non-existent 20th anniversary celebrations. And you, you've, well, you're you, still there, man. If, you, if, you're, if you've been around for 20 years, you've earned the right, haven't you? I'm, so, no problem. I'm, you glad you noticed. I'm glad you noticed. No one else has. Timmy Mallet. We must get, get Timmy Mallet on there. I want Timmy Mallet to congratulate me as well. All right, can we get that? Andrew, what's on your mind? Well, the post office scandal, the reason I think people get traction with people is the, the ordinariness of the people. Yes, yes. Victimised by it. And people can sympathise with people that they identify with. And they, uh, your local postmaster, you think, is like you, he's like me, he's like most of us, and now he's caught up in this. This could have happened to me. I could have been this person. So I'm, I'm not. I'm not putting my head above the parapet. I'm not pursuing fame or fortune. I'm not trying to get rich. I, I mean, the way that Gabby Hinsliff, in a rather splendid piece in the Guardian today, describes um, Alan Bates as as ploughing his savings into a rural Welsh post office, hoping for a quiet life. That perfectly encapsulates what you're saying, really, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, and, and the fact that we're so reliant on big IT systems run by big IT companies. This could happen to any of us that use something that relies on the services of a big IT company. Like a butterfly Everything. crushed on a wheel, and we're, we're, the, we're all butterflies. Yeah, I mean, your Oyster card runs, I presume, on an IT system provided by a big IT company. It does when I remember to take it with me in the morning. Yeah, quite, um, yeah. quite. <laughs> so if you, if you, if you find... That the IT behind that... It's kind of scary, is. isn't it? Yeah, you're right. It's got a dystopian flavour to it. You sort of... The police say, we know that you were at the scene of the crime because we've got the technology to prove it, and you know that you weren't. It's a sort yeah. of... It's, it's another example of... of com it's a computer-says-no story, isn't it? Yeah. 
And supposing you get home tonight and there's a letter from TFL saying our system says that you now owe us 10,000 quid because it's glitched and our system says that you owe us this money just because. And, and you know and you, you don't know, and, and, and you're on the you hook don't. for it. And, you, and the next thing you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're having your collar felt and you're facing jail. I mean, the frust- yeah. that's it, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's you've all got, of the got, things. You've, you've got to find the 10,000 quid or... You're going to jail. It's an anxiety dream. That's true. It's a real life anxiety dream. You know, when in the, in the, in the, in the dream, when you turn to someone who you think's going to help you, or you think you've found safety, you've reached a place of security, and then and then that they turn around and uh, I don't know, they're a vampire as well, or whatever your personal anxiety dream may be, or you still yeah. you still yeah. have to sit the exam. It's actually come true. It's it's that point where you think no that 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 it's upside down. What's black is white. What's wrong is right. That that is, and that I think you're right. I think somehow they've managed to communicate that in a way that you cannot do in a book or or, or in a, because you don't have the empathy unless it's a drama. I think I, I Mary Beard, who was a wonderful guest on Full Disclosure last year, she she said something today about society needs these stories. Society needs storytellers. It needs drama. It's how you create empathy. How many times... Thank you, Andrew. I hope it was worth the wait. How many times have I said to you, fascists hate drama. They hate uh, fiction. They hate stories. They hate actors. They hate lovies. They hate showbiz. Do you know why? Because stories create empathy. Stories let you imagine what it's like to be somebody else. So, I don't know who's getting a kicking today from, from, from the sort of Lazy Bones Brigade are we going after people in small boats? We're going after parents of, of, of children who, who are not going to school. How are we going to give them a kicking? Well, whatever you do, don't spend any time whatsoever imagining what it might be like to be in their shoes. Just, just make, you know, sweeping statements about how rotten they are and then invite lots of other people to attack them. But a drama about a child being bullied or a child having a terrible time at school, a drama that speaks to the statistics regarding mental health or self-harm or even worse that is pretty much an epidemic among our young people, a drama that tells that story well, will reach places that a million newspaper articles simply can't. And that, I think, is what's happened with the post offices. 10.47 is the time. There's another smear here in already, one that I, I, I've missed from my list. Oh, that could be a jingle as well. I've missed from my list. Uh, so I, I might start keeping a smear here list. So the more complicated my new th- feature idea becomes, the more certain it is that it will have been abandoned and forgotten about by the end of the week. But this could be the exception. This could be my New Year's resolution, my first New Year's resolution. We're launching a new feature, and we're jolly well going to stay with it. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Oh, 10.51 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, don't, don't let me go home today without reminding you of another example of, of the smear, Kia, campaign being undertaken by client journalists, terrified for reasons they wouldn't be able to explain to you of, of, a, of a Labour government. Uh, well, I suppose one of the reasons why they're terrified is that they're less likely to get jobs as director of communications in a, in a Labour government or to sort of slide effortlessly into and out of Downing Street. Um, uh, whether or not there will be a left-wing equivalent of that, we'll have to wait and see. But why has the post office scandal, the Horizon scandal, reached parts that 20 years, give or take, of journalism, that the mighty Ian Hislop, who you just heard speaking to Andrew Marr last week, that the BBC, with all of its uh, enormous platform, that that an author serialised in the Daily Mail, none of them could reach the parts that the last week has seen reached. Why? Is it something to do with the now? It can't just be the drama, that the Jimmy uh, McGovern treatment, as one of my correspondents has just called it. It's Jimmy McGovern's Hillsborough drama, which was seen as very much revivifying that urgent cause. But this is a little different. This seems to have captured the public imagination in a way that the, the Hillsborough families, tragically, for, for much of that period of time, could only dream of. And the stakes are so much lower albeit still high, they are considerably lower than what the Hillsborough families went through. Most of the Hillsborough families went through. I appreciate some of the people affected by the post office scandal did um, uh, lose their lives, but the, the, the numbers are all I'm looking at when I make that comparison. So why? What's happened? Is it, is, it, is it something to do with where we are politically, historically, that a David and Goliath story is so 
so alive? I don't know. Jane's in South Woodford. Jane, what would you like to say? Um, hi. Hello. Um, hello. I mean, a, a couple of your um, last callers have, have touched on this. Go on. Um, but I think, you know, the, the reason that it's, it's um, captured the nation is because it's encapsulated the whole story. I mean, I've, I've always... Um, had my eye on that story over the last 20 years, but it's something that's always been bubbling and you just think, oh God, this is awful. Yeah. Um, and then the drama came on and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll give it a go. I'm not really a keen on, keen on biopics and doctor dramas, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll watch it. And the thing about what it did, it, it humanised these individuals, these um, little people, these people that were just completely um, battered by by a, a, a massive organisation. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think what, you know, the rule of drama, um, I am a, a producer who works in um, drama and comedy, okay. a creative producer. So, I mean, the rule of drama in scripts is investment in the characters. And what that drama did, what the writer did, was invested in these few characters showed the, the horrificness of what was going on. And then at that midpoint, they had that village hall moment and yeah. hundreds of people started to turn up and then more and more and more people. So it's very well paced and very well, um, the drama built really well. Yeah. But my point being is that I think we needed, because this had been going on for so long and swept under various different carpets and, oh, yeah, 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 no one really, really cares. When you put it together and you put great actors in those positions and seeing people... Um, you know, killing themselves, um, yes. people's lives ruined. That poor woman that you know had the ECT yeah. um, treatment and has now apparently forgotten her childhood. That's right. Yeah, she's uh, in the paper today, a, actually. Yeah, as a result, and and I think you just need to. You couldn't do it with journalism. You couldn't do it in a documentary. No. It has to be a drama. It has to be a drama. I really think it does because you need to, like I said, invest in those characters. It's really, really oh, um, important. There it is. To... I never. I, I mean, so, sorry. I, you probably think that's obvious because of what you do for a living. But that, I mean, that word "invest in those characters." That's exactly what it is, isn't it? It's a diff So even as I read Private Eye and I read these stories, there's no there but for the grace of God go I, or there's no. There's, em there's sympathy, but probably not empathy, because I'll turn the page and read another story about another scandal, and then I'll turn the page and read another, you know, and there's a, there, there's a, a cartoon, or mm. whereas this is, this is, right, this is my story. I'm telling you a story, and you yeah. will care about the characters in it, and the minute you care about the characters in this story, exactly. everything changes, and it doesn't actually matter whether the story is true or not. That's what makes a good drama, caring about the characters in it, and if it's yes. true, then it goes off like a like a firecracker, as we've seen in the last uh, few days. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, so... That, that Are you I surprised it got made? It would have been a tough pitch, wouldn't it? Given all of the things we've talked about today, all of the fact that it's been around for so long, that the inquiry's already underway, that the Met are on the case. Yes, and that, that's really interesting. I don't know how long um, it was, um, you know, when it was pitched, who it's pitched to, mm. and how... It, about i don't actually know it was a documentary um, maker that pitched it and, and and the broadcaster put them in partnership i think with a with a drama right. maker right? so they because the itv wanted it to be a double bubble sort yeah. of scenario but but it is it must have been a tough pitch thinking about it yeah absolutely and and you know but also and it's ignited now because and you know it's set a fire under under this because it's not actually it's a story but it hasn't got an end Mm. And and now I think what's happened is you know the public <laughs> want to see all the these underdogs, all these victims get justice, and you know and that that is the main um, drive I think now behind all of this. I mean, and I know what you're saying about viewing figures, and I don't know I don't know what the viewing figures well. are. It's done well, but it's not. It's done well, yeah. and it will do well. Um, it will do well on consolidated as well because yes. I mean I'm, I think it's, it's sitting there now, so people just go in and, and watch it. I mean, when I started watching it, I actually watched all of them in one go. Yeah, because it was so compelling, which never happens in a toxic drama because they're very factual and they're very. But because they, you know, it was so well 
direct, you know, performances were so well directed yeah. as well. By well it, was, James it, was more like, it was more like a Harlan Coben drama than an actual based on real yeah. life happened in the, in the shires of, yeah. of, of the United Kingdom drama, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. It was so twisty. Exactly. So, um, and I think that's what it is. You just have to hit, you, ha- you know, put the story all in one place, explain where it started and where we are now. And in the meantime, show all the victims and punch you in the heart. I punch you in the heart. I, I see. There, there's a temptation yesterday, Jane, to to think that it said something bad about us, but it doesn't, does it? It's it. it you know, you you are that. What you the way you've explained it there. Two phrases will stay with me. The investment in the characters and the punch in the heart. You, journalists can't really do that. Not in the same no. way. They can. No. So the, 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 the fuse is shorter, isn't it? It doesn't burn as long, the fuse, even if you've got sort of Michael Burke in Ethiopia with, with starving children. You don't know their story. You just know their current plight. And they're two exactly. different things. Thank you. Have you got anything good on the go at the moment? Have you got anything good bubbling under I'm development? Ha- <laughs> I, I will do, yes. Um, I'm having a break at the moment. I've just done a, a, a couple of uh, cozy cop dramas and uh, I'm... <laughs> I'm uh, also, you know, writing and stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. <laughs> well, have fun and good luck with it. I, I, I am desperate one day to, to uh, uh, resurrect my acting career, but I don't think it would be appropriate to start badgering Jane for a small walk-on part in something at this point in proceedings. I'm too busy setting up Smear Kier as a new feature on the program, of which more later. It's coming up to eleven o'clock. I think it's fair to say that I went around the houses quite a lot during the last hour. Um, who else can we put on that list of celebrities that we're going to get to mark my 20th anniversary on LBC? That's so tricky to do, isn't it? Mr. Blobby, is he still around? Can we get Mr. Blobby? Oh, blub, 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 blub. Um, so we may take a few more calls on this. It's really captured your imagination, which is the point of the phone-in. But there are other stories I like the look of. I, 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 I'm looking at the restaurant industry. I'm looking at the state that it's in at the beginning of this year. And I'm wondering what it's going to look like by the end. James O'Brien on LBC. They, they don't get the cheeky girls, yeah? Um, Barry Barry from EastEnders. He's in an advert at the moment. He'll be up for it. Uh, Roland Rat, maybe? Uh, just because... I oh, know, it's going back a bit too far. It's got to sum up the 20 years that we've that we've been on air. Um, anyway. Are we back on air yet? Are we... Yeah. So I'll leave that with you then, yeah? Is that all right? For the big, for the big part A. The big 2-0, yeah? The big 2-0. It's four minutes after 11 and you're listening to James O'Brien live on LBC where we turn our attention next to one of the trickier stories that I think I've put in front of you in recent years because because I can't I can't quite imagine what this is like and and I, and I can't I know what one bit of it is like I have a taste of what one bit is like one bit of it is like um it didn't. It, it ended well, if you see what I mean. The number of live births in England and Wales last year was was the lowest since two thousand and two. The 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 story has gained traction. These figures are, are, are from late last year. The story has gained traction because of similar situations in Italy, actually, and both the Italian Prime Minister, who is from a uh, a, a fascistic party. And therefore, uh, Rishi Sunak spent some time at the end of last year cozying up to her. And the Pope even, I think, has got involved on this. They're, they're worried about the Italian birth rate. Now, the birth rate in England and Wales is also troubling. Jonathan Portes, one of the um, finest, one of the, one of the best, one of the finest jewels in the firmament of British academia. Jonathan Portes, a professor of economics and public policy at King's College London, has calculated the total fertility rate to be about one and a half children per woman, which would make it the lowest since records began in 1939. Um, That is significant for a number of reasons. You don't need me to talk to you about demographic challenges. The two worst things that could happen in... Stop sending me the names of... of, of uh, comical celebrities, all right? I, I've, I've, they're, 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 well, all right, don't stop, it's funny. Zig and Zag, are they still around? I, 
I don't need to explain to you that the the the, the, the Scylla and Charybdis of anti-immigration rhetoric and a falling birth rate and an aging population. I, I mean, of all the disgusting things that racist politicians do in order to frighten you about people who want to come here and work, ignore the fact that it will make your retirement worse. Is among ignoring that fact is among the the worst elements of that whole Farragist rhetoric, you know, the, the idea that we've got a falling birth rate, an ageing population, an overburdened health service, but the last thing we want is Johnny Foreigner coming over here to work as a nurse or a doctor. We should train our own. That's such a ludicrous congregation of circumstances that you wonder how on earth 80% of the British media can be heavily involved in amplifying it and, and d- delivering it to your Auntie Doris's Facebook page. But the decision not to have a child is what I um, want to talk about. Because underneath these numbers, there will be and there must be people who always thought that they would be parents, but don't think they can afford it. And and I, I, I listen, I'm quite a, forgive me for sounding like a flump for a minute, all right, but I am quite a sensitive person in the sense that I don't find it hard to imagine what it's like to be in your boots talking to to Jane at the end there about why drama sometimes allows empathy to flourish in ways that documentary or or, or straight journalism can't. It's because we have varying levels of capacity for imagining other people's plights, other people's circumstances. And someone who is utterly incapable of doing that is a sociopath. Um... Uh, somebody who, for example, might talk about food banks being unnecessary because you can feed your family for 30 pence is, is devoid of empathy, utterly devoid of empathy. Uh, I, I think you could probably say the same about the way that Boris Johnson approached the COVID-19 pandemic. A politician in charge of a country who has no empathy is a recipe for the sort of disasters that ensued. But most of us have some empathy. Most of us have some and some people have loads people who we call empaths almost have too much in that in that imagining and feeling other people's suffering becomes unbearable for them and and that's why this story fascinates me so much because i don't think anyone really ever sees you i I don't think anyone ever really acknowledges your your existence and i can't quite until i look at the numbers you know I can't quite imagine what it's like. But when you look at the numbers, sometimes the decision would be made for you, wouldn't it? Sometimes you would think the numbers were making the decision for you. So you've got two incomes at the moment. And forgive me for going a bit nuclear. I'm I'm, I'm talking about two people deciding to have a a baby together. It it doesn't matter whether they're gay or straight or same-sex or whatever it may be. You've got two incomes... And you have done the calculations when the outgoings are pretty close to the incomings. The idea of one of you not working for a year or two years and your outgoings, even when one of you returns, the one of you who didn't work returns to work, or even if you both continue to work more or less throughout, the increase in outgoings, childcare, um, uh, and, and sundry other outgoings, costs mean that if you actually crunched the numbers, you would conclude that you can't have children. Now, I think, and, and I have to be completely honest with you and tell you that I am... I'm I'm flying with my eyes shut here. I, I, I will attempt to imagine what it's like, but it will be hard for me. So we struggle to, to have children. I, I don't know whether you know that. It depends when you started listening to the program. But we did. So I have looked into that abyss of desperately wanting to be a parent. And I'm not really talking now to people who've never wanted to be parents. I'm talking to people who do or did or at least presumed they would have children but because of circumstances have not now i think that if quite a lot of people crunched the numbers really carefully 
they wouldn't have they, they wouldn't have had children. I, I, I think sometimes it happens by accident. I'm not going to give you a biology lesson. Sometimes you you know you don't really. I, mean, I don't know how you live your life, and this is what I mean about flying with my eyes shut. Is is, is that I am. I'm lucky now that I, d I don't really worry about how much things cost. I, there have been times in my life when I have, but I, I'm, I don't really, I can't quite conceive, apart from illness or, or, or something that profound, I can't quite conceive of, of what a, you know, a truly life-changing, financially speaking, experience would look like. But a baby is one. And for my generation... And probably up to anyone in their sort of forties, early forties or below, you, you just took it in. You just you just dealt with it. Crikey, we're going to have a baby. How are we going to afford it? Oh, we'll manage. But you look at it now. I think. I think. And you say, how are we going to afford it? And you say, well, we actually can't. I didn't know how much childcare cost before I became a father, but I knew I must be able to afford it because if someone on the sort of salary that I was on and Mrs. O'Brien was on were not able to afford childcare, it would have been a national scandal. Well, now it kind of is a national scandal. People on average incomes are actually unable to contemplate one of the most natural steps of family life that, that humanity can conceive of. So what's it like? What's it like to realize or to calculate or to decide that you're not going to become a parent? And remember, I'm in no way seeking to alienate or exclude people who've never really wanted to. I think you're also part of a constituency that gets ignored, that doesn't get uh, acknowledged or spoken to. And, and we, we've done our best to rectify that. But it's not really you that I'm speaking to today. I'm, I'm speaking to people who almost can't quite believe that you have made or are making or are likely to make this decision. I, ju I just want to know what it's like. And, I, and I, I, you know, I want to know the numbers as well. 0345 6060973. But this isn't just financial, as Laura reminds us. There is another group. And, and I've spoken to a couple of people like this on air, and I'm keen to speak to more. People who have decided not to have children because of the current and perceived future state of the world. A couple of you have reminded me that people like Bill Gates have uh, warned about population growth, warned about birth rates, uh, the, the survival of, of civilization, of humanity, demands that the countries where infant deaths were endemic reduce their birth rates because the birth rate is still tied to the number of infants that would historically die but more and more are surviving thank god but it means that the population is exploding so when i say to you why are you not and it's not having any children it might be that you're only having one you thought you'd have three but you can only afford one the experience of having one has made you realize you can't afford two you can't afford another. So it's, 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 it's in a way, this is a phone in about the children that you're never going to have and, and what that feels like. And if it's because of the climate change, if it's because of demographic considerations, environmental considerations, um, I, I, I kind of take my hat off to you on the one hand, while on the other, I, I, I wonder if you were my friend whether I'd be trying to persuade you to change your mind, because it is at risk of sounding like some sort of hallmark card. It is, and it can be, one of the most incredible things that you will ever do in your life. So why have you decided not to have brackets, more closed brackets, children? Because you must have done, if these numbers are correct, and they are. Uh, we are well below the fertility rate in France, Denmark, and Sweden. Oddly, we're above Germany. I don't know why. I, I, these things are interesting, aren't they? Um, most of Southern and Eastern Europe as well. We, we, we are around the same level as Italy, even lower than us. What, 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 what explains your decision? And crucially on this program, we, we love it on this program, is, is what does it feel like with that decision? Because I bet it's hard to talk about. I bet, well, I don't think it's hard to talk about. I bet you don't often get the opportunity to talk about it, especially not to your parent friends. To your friends who've had children, they might think you're a bit weird. I don't think you're weird. 
I think you're really interesting and, and possibly quite courageous. 0345 606 is the number that you need. It's 1116. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 11 is the time. And, and, and clearly, I, I, I knew this would touch some nerves. Um, and, and I'm conscious of that. You can trust me to handle it sensitively. I would call in James to talk, but I'll cry. And I'm at work and I, I don't want to do that. Um, and I, I mean, I also, the simple cost of renting. Emma puts it characteristically well. Uh, I follow a lot of prepper stroke collapse forums or, or reddits where the youth are discussing the state of the world from their perspectives. They're actively deciding not to have kids. It's a conscious decision that many are taking because they can't afford to rent their own one bedroom places, let alone buy something more suitable for a settled family life. That's one of the problems with vulture capitalism. They want the churn of fresh workers, but refuse to provide the basic stability necessary to ensure births. They're ensuring their own and our own collapse. Hi, crikey. I, I sort of uh, even bigger ramifications than we've already touched on. Um, and speaking of their own personal situation, they write, I couldn't in good conscience bring more than one child into this world, and, I, and I've made that decision medically permanent so those capitalists would discard me now not quite squid games but the whole world feels dystopic at the moment the decline is neither a surprise nor a mystery i hadn't thought of the politics of it uh, you know the, the people who are saying that there's no such thing as poverty and if you can't afford to do that or do the other then you need to move house or get another job but it's there isn't it is, is this a, is this an inevitable conclusion of, of what emma calls vulture capitalism Drive down wages as far as you can in order to keep more of the money for yourself and then sit back and wonder why people aren't having children anymore. Thomas is in Braintree. Thomas, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, First mate. one caller, it's nice to speak to you. Welcome. Um, I'm in my 30s and me and my partner got married this year or last year now even. Yes. And uh, just before the pandemic hit, we were lucky enough with the low interest rate to be able to get a small flat for ourselves okay. now. My partner um, had a child when she was 18, so I'm a stepfather and he's now um, coming up to 13 years old and it's a wonderful experience to have been in his life. But we're yes. at the point where I, I'm lucky enough that, <clears throat> excuse me, that I have a good job. My partner has a good job. Um, we haven't got rich parents who've been able to help us and mm. our, our flat wouldn't be big enough to have another child. And even if it was about our budget, our household budget just doesn't allow for it. And it's, it's just heartbreaking for me really um and it's not this isn't something i've normally said to anyone to be honest no i understand but it, it's it's heartbreaking for me to think that i won't get that wonderful experience of having my own child i love my stepson with all my heart do. no uh, I, I, I understand but it's something that we grow up expecting to be isn't yeah. it for, for mo yeah. not everybody i don't I'm not, i appreciate that not everybody does but the, but the massive majority of us just grow up expecting to be parents one day that, that's exactly it. You know, my, my you know my parents would love to be grandparents, and it's just it. You know, if I bring if we brought another child in, there, there's we just don't have the space. And what kind of life could we afford them? You know, I don't and know. I don't know what the answer is to that because no. cause some people would say if you've got love, you don't need anything else, and some people will raise families in circumstances that are you know materially far inferior to yours. But that doesn't mm. really that doesn't work, does it? You're looking at you want a child to be comfortable. You want to be comfortable yourself. Is, yeah. it, is it? I mean, presumably, it's a sort of combination of of cost of living, interest rates, and most of all, property yes. prices. So you you can't you know keep the baby in the bottom drawer or something like that. You'd want you'd well, want to, that, you'd need another room. That's exactly it. And in you know in my area of the country in the southeast, it's expensive to live here. And I know I've had friends who have moved to other parts of the countries where area is uh, comparatively cheaper. Mm. Um, but you know and. Uh, it's it's not viable for us, you know. Because our, of the job. our parents, yeah, the jobs. The parents are getting older. You know, my life is here. My roots are here, and um, you know, it's you know something has to give essentially, and it does all come down to the budget at the end of the day, and that. And it um, is, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because you never yeah. see this coming on the horizon until it's until it's smack in front of you. Have you spoken That's to your it. wife about it? Have you had the conversation? We we have. We've been in. You know, we we wanted we want another child, and we've yes. been discussing it really. You know, yeah. since we got married in June, it's been a topic of conversation, and we come back to it, and we look at it, and we try and make it work, and we just can't see how we can make it work. Um, 
I'm sorry. It's just, it's really hard. Thank you. Um, um, you know, the, like you say, there are people who do it in much harder circumstances than us, and my heart goes out to all those people. Of course, but, but, but we can just, only live the life we've got, can't we? We can't, you know, yeah, that's the point. Yeah, we can only work with the bricks, that, but, but we can only build with the bricks we've been given. Do you know, just as you said the word southeast, literally almost to the mm. nanosecond, Niall texted to say, try buying a three to four bedroom home in the southeast on an average salary, James. There's yeah. your answer. And, yeah. And, it's ridiculous. I was walking um, through town the other day and walked past an estate agents, and there was what I would consider a, you know, a, a nice home for sure. Mm, but mm. that was that, that was a million pounds, and it's not what you would consider a million pound home. It's just a, a, a slightly large home. Or if I wanted to buy a slightly bigger flat, I, I you know, I might be paying three hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand pounds. Yeah. Um, you know, and combined with the fees and and just everything. It's, it's just not reasonable. You know, my generation have spent our entire 20s. I spent my entire 20s saving for right. a deposit and being able to afford a home. Uh, we, don't, we don't have the reserves. So, I, so I'm, I'm not lucky enough to have and that will be that will be the kicker. So if you, if you, yeah, that will be that will be a large part of it. And, and and also, you know, that changes everything as well for the generations above you. You know, if you were lucky enough to have parents who were a little wealthier and they could free up some of their money and pass it on to you that would affect their lifestyle and it would affect their retirement or or, or whatever it would be I, I do i do think that we massively underestimate the sociological impact of the uh rapacious economic policies of the last decade and a half or, 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 or vulture capitalism or whatever you prefer to call it and uh, you know thomas has done nothing wrong we're back to the silent social contract that we spoke about yesterday the, the, the breaching of the silent social contract but becoming a homeowner becoming a parent these were steps that we once took for granted but largely because of the gulf between well largely because of pay inequality the 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 the, the, the pay that the bosses get compared to what the rest of the workforce gets and the cost of property that social contract has been broken in this instance. Connor puts it even more brutally. He says, forever being told that if you can't afford children, you shouldn't have them. So we won't. Yeah, we're back to the lazy bones approach to the news, aren't we? If you can't afford children, don't have any. Don't have any if you can't afford them. Well, then, And you just find yourself wondering who's going to look after us when we're old. If, if loads and loads of people have decided they can't afford to have children. Well, we'll get some immigrants. Oh, you can't do that. Because the same sort of people who say if you can't afford children, don't have any, are exactly the same sort of people who say we shouldn't be having any immigration, we should be training our own. It's almost as if they're as thick as mints, isn't it? 26 after 11 is the time. Grace is in Lucknow, Lucknow in Oxfordshire. Grace, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. Hello. Hi, it's Grace. Yeah, I'm a first-time caller as well, actually. Welcome. Um, thank you. And... Uh, I think it was like what you said about when you decide to have a child, you do the budgeting and you sit down and we did all of that and we did the spreadsheet and um, we bought the house and done all the things because we were on what I like to think actually a lost money. I think you know, yeah. we're on more than the average person. We have a joint income of 160000 We're both on the £80,000 jobs. I never thought, I, I never really worried too much about having children i never worried too much about planning to have no, children i understand I, do. I was the same when i was your age yeah and i luckily we're both in the the technology sector so you know, we, we never struggled with our careers but i actually had to once we did that budgeting and that probably would have been just before covid i realized that even on my salary i with a maternity pay of 12 weeks with the mortgage that we had yes we were going to be slightly under. We were going to be in the red. And we had, you know, cars that were on lease and that was on lease for another two years. And there was only so much we could pull back because things were already in place. Um, so I actually went and got a new job and luckily got a new job. And in my sector, it's that they're quite good with the benefits and maternity. They're quite forward thinking. And so I got one that was six months full pay. Right to allow me to Crikey. actually have that time with a baby <laughs> yes. and, you know, actually be a mum because otherwise I was debating, could, could I do it or would I have to go back to work at three months, four months? And mm. I do have American colleagues in America which have had to do that and it's not nice. It's not It's not easy. It's, and, and it's um, not a so choice really either. Different. I think that's the crucial point, isn't it? I, I, I don't want to malign anybody who chooses to do that, but... but 
because yeah. I, I think it is it is absolutely your, your your freedom to do that but it needs to be a choice it can't i mean if it's something that you're doing with a really heavy heart and really reluctantly then that's going to impact every area of your life I, i'm glad thank you for your honesty because obviously for, for a lot of people that will sound like a a, a very large joint income, but you, you, you buy your home and you buy your cars or you lease your cars and you make your decisions up until the point where parenthood begins to beckon according to what you are earning. And no yeah. one likes to go then, backwards yeah. either, do they? No, no. And also with the house that I have, because people think, oh, you know, you've probably got, I, it is a lovely house in, in a, you know, it's a lovely area, it's a little village, mm. but it's, it's a three bedroom terrace house. Which yes. the third bedroom is a box room. So if I was to now think, okay, my daughter's eight months old, I'll be going back to work in February. Do I want to go again? Mm. Could I afford in the current climate to then get a bigger house? You know, c- could I raise one in that house? To have is another. So so me? we can afford yeah. this one, but can we afford another one? It's not a question about yeah. never being a parent, but not having as many children as you might have expected. And then if you can afford another, maybe you wanted three. Maybe when you got married and you do that thing that we all do where we paint our dreams together and we'll have three children and we'll do this. And we'll and, and I think unless you're silly rich, unless you're silly wealthy, there are doors closing now. And, and just because some of your doors are open doesn't mean that other doors that you expected to be open at this stage in your life are, are, are not closing. That's the point. That's why I'm particularly grateful to you, Grace, for ringing in because I didn't want this phone-in to be about exclusively about people who, who cannot have children because of the financial situation, because of the economic situation. It's about your relationship with parenting being changed by circumstance, by economics, or by principle. I, you know, that there are people who will not, who are expecting to be parents, but whose understanding of the climate crisis is so acute that they cannot, in all conscience, bring another mouth into this world. And, and I haven't spoken to anyone like that yet, but it, it, it's all part of the same story. We're looking at the number of live births in England and Wales being the lowest in 20 years and the actual total fertility rate being the lowest since records began in 1939. And we are wondering why. And those are, there are, here are some of your answers. 11.31 is the time. Thomas Watts has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. I, d- I take your point, David, I, I, and, and you, you phrase it quite nicely. So I don't really buy into the, oh, when I were a lad, school of thought. Because you work with the bricks that you're given. You can only build with the bricks that you're given. But we do have different expectations. David writes, makes me laugh, the expectations of people today. I was one of four children living in a three-bedroom house. We shared bedrooms, including just a box room where we had a bunk bed. We didn't have holidays. Um, You have to give things up to have children. I I, I mean, not everybody does, of course, but I, I do take your point. There will be lots of people who are happy living in circumstances that some of the people who've decided... They don't want to um, uh, share. But one point you miss, David, I think, is the relationship between income and property prices. I, I mean, there is no getting away from it. I remember one of the real penny drop moments for me in this job talking about property was when I'd take calls from perfectly well-meaning people from what I think is called the boomer generation who would express skepticism or, 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 or misgivings about the difficulty or the impossibility of younger people getting on the housing ladder. And they'd say things like, well, we, we worked and we bought a house in 1964 for two, two, three thousand pounds. And you just say, well, what was your income? And they'd say, well, about a thousand pounds a year or about 600. So you're, you're paying three to four times your annual income for a home. Well, now you're paying 10 times. So just do the maths. It's a completely different proposition. And of course, if you're paying that kind of money for your home, you can't, it doesn't matter how many bunk beds or box rooms you've got, you can't afford to feed the children. Proliferation of food banks. It's weird because by many, many measures, we must be better off than we were, for example, in the 1960s or 70s. We must be. But then you've got things like food banks, which we didn't have them. I, I don't know what the answer to these questions is. Welfare cuts, maybe we're not better off. 
Maybe we're looking at the wrong averages, looking at the means instead of the medians or the medians instead of the means. I didn't do very well in my AO level statistics. I forgot, never really knew what the difference was between all those different sorts of averages. But do you see what I mean? Maybe the, you know, talk about being the fifth biggest economy in the world. That just means we've got some people with a ton of money. It doesn't actually mean that we've got the fifth healthiest economy in the world or the fifth fairest economy in the world. We've got the largest total amount of money in our, our, our economy, the fifth largest total amount of money in our economy. How it's divvied up may be less fair now than it was 30 years ago. But that decision not to have a child, whatever it is based on, just talk me through it. Amber's in Redbridge. Amber, what would you like to say? Yes, hello, hi. Uh, basically, just got to give my um, experience um, of what happened to me. So about 15 years ago, um, you know, we newlyweds, we just bought our first property. Um, and uh, subsequently, I was made redundant. A week later, my husband was made redundant. Yuck. We got a job within about a month of each, you know, of, of this happening. So we were back on the sort of ladder. Right. Um, but then, like, literally within about two months, I found out I was pregnant with our first um, daughter. Gosh. So, um, and I, I was worried because we, we, you know, we've got a mortgage. Um, you know, any furniture that I had bought was bought on my credit cards. Um, and, you know, we, we, we didn't have any, anything left in, in the account by the time that we purchased our property yes um and my concern was like what the hell what am i gonna what am i gonna give my you know my child you know where's the food coming where's this coming so um you know in the long run i mean when i think back you know i was thinking you know there's ways of thinking about this so either you worry about it or you get on with it so i was quite lucky because family sort of chipped in and i said to them look i'm going to end up with so many baby clothes from friends and you know uh, you know, and and you sort of went, went, you know, my mother very helpfully went around the family and said, she needs a high chair, she needs a pram, she needs a cot. <laughs> so sort of divided out all of the, um, you know, the items that I probably needed for for the baby's first arrival. Yes. You know, so we we kind of got on with it. So I do think that, you know... I worried unnecessarily. You know, once, I, I, you know, I, once I, I'm grateful coming, to you. You've you put, you, yeah, you've yeah. put this very sensitively, and and you've acknowledged yeah. that you had sources of help and assistance that, yeah. that, that so not that everybody really might help. have. But there is a sense of it being, uh, you know, it will be a struggle, but it will also be worth it. That, that yeah. I, I'm fairly confident most people would well, have taken that into account. Side of it, when I see, so I've got two scenarios. You know, um. When I know, I've been blessed with three kids since. Um, after my first, I had a number of complications, so I did lose. A, uh, I miscarried um, children oh, after sorry. that. Um, so by the time that I got to having my first son, who was actually my third son right. uh, by then, you know there was desperation. You yes. know, and then you get to that point where you think that you know I'd give any amount just to make sure that I carry safely this time round, and get, you know actually deliver safely. Yes, of course. So you have that, and then you think, as a mum, you think, you know what, whatever it costs, I don't care. I'll, you know, what, it, you, you know, we'll get there, sort of thing. You know, so at that point, by, by my, you know, the time that I got to my first son, that I delivered, you know, safely. Um, and my concern was not money. My concern was just getting, you know, yes. making sure that no, I had Well, I, 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 do, I do understand that. I do yeah. know what that's like. And, and then, it, but, it, you know, you... now, because we've had three children, um, you know, we, we, you know, my husband was like, well, shall we try for a fourth? And if you ask me, yeah, I probably would want another fourth. Yes. But, you know, the, the, by then, the, uh, the other three had started growing up and I started realising, oh, my God, my kids are going to need tuition fees they're going to need you know to, you know um to be helped along in their education they're going to need some tutoring you know which i've got to pay for privately mm. i've got a daughter that's going to do gcses this year and um you know when i calculate the amount of tuition that we've got her privately i'm pay- paying out nearly a thousand pound just for her tuition, just to make sure she gets those See, grades. I, I wonder why we feel, and I'm, I'm, I think everybody because of the expectation of the children. Well, no, I you can't. Get, I, you don't, how, how can you possibly answer the question before I finish speaking? I, I just said. I, I, said how, I wonder why we feel. You don't know what I was going to say. Next, you're as bad as that bloke on LBC who interrupts oh, his callers all the time. The, the <laughs> mid-morning bloke who, who, who thinks mm. he'd think, eat himself if he oh, was yeah, made of chocolate. Think. You know the fella. <laughs> so why, why, why do we feel? It's class, it's status, but the idea of dialing down in order to 
have more children seems to be almost anathema to this conversation. The idea that, okay, so we won't have, we can have another child, but we can't have the private tuition. We could, do you see what I mean? You, we, 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 it's it's, it's like our social know, status is a straitjacket, I think, sometimes. The thing is that you don't, you know, you don't necessarily first, you know, if I think about now, you know, being on both sort of sides, yes. you know, when I think about it, I'm not concerned about the milk and the nappies and the cot and all that. I'm more concerned that I'm going to have to save up for tuition fees. I'm going to have to make sure. But they're, got, they're, they're some, well some people would education. say they were luxury. They're luxuries rather than necessities. But I, I think that the, the point I'm clumsily trying to make is that we've the lens through which we view the world is unique and it's defined by our circumstances, including our, our, our self perception our status you sort of think so somebody listening to this and a few of you across with me for not putting david in idiot's corner and on reflection i think you're probably right it's why wouldn't you want to be um churning out children to provide serfs and staff for people like jacob reese mogg as opposed to demanding a better standard of living for your own children and, and we're not it's gone the other way the redistribution of wealth is upside down and 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 yet you can only work with the bricks that you've been given so to say well when i were a lad it is actually a bit pointless. It is a little bit stupid. Um, who, who here is prepared to give up something that they have got in return for something that they have always taken for granted, i.e. the right to become a parent? Well, I'm going to give up something that I've already got in order to do something that I presumed would just happen to me naturally. I think there's a reckoning coming, don't you, on some generational level, particularly with the side order of immigration continuing to be demonised. Yeah, you, you look at the Labour Party, you look at Keir Starmer, you look now at the growing desperation uh, uh, from client journalists in the right-wing media trying to smear him today for um, daring to oppose the death penalty and not even asking to get paid for opposing the death penalty. That, that's what the Sun is attacking Keir Starmer for today. Opposing the death penalty for free. God, what a, what a rat bag he is. This is the paper, of course, that thinks Boris Johnson is the bee's knees. Um, I'll leave you to try and work out what possible disorder could explain how someone working for free to abolish the death penalty is the bad guy and somebody lying to the House of Commons and then lying about lying to the House of Commons and then running away like a scared cat when presented with the consequences of his own actions is the good guy. It's coming up to quarter to 12. Alex is in Newcastle. Alex, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, you said you wanted to speak to someone who didn't want to have kids uh, because of the climate crisis. Well, no, so I, wa I, I want to speak to someone. I don't know if this is you. We'll find out imminently. Yeah, I want to speak to someone yeah. who does want to have children in some sort of emotional, atavistic sense, but has decided because of the climate crisis that they can't in all conscience go ahead, because I find that position fascinating. Yeah. Is that you? Yeah, that, that's or are me, you yeah, that's But me. I mean, on a scale of one to ten, how strong is your parental, your paternal impulse? Well, I'm only 25, so I don't want to have kids yet, but I have okay. always wanted to have kids. I always wanted to be a dad, yeah. And you don't so. think you ever will? No, I, I just I don't see the situation climate-wise, um, cost-of-living-wise, just getting any better. And I just I don't think that I could afford it, and I don't think that I want to raise a kid in the world that it is right now, is the sad truth. I, 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 are you courting? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have a partner who, who feels the same way. Gosh. Arrived independently at the at the conclusion. And, and among your and peer, among your age. peer group, is it is it a conversation that you have, or is it a position that's explored, or or, or is it still quite sort of individual? Yeah, like it, it's. I mean, it, it varies, of course, of course. But like amongst my my uh, some of my friends, yeah, they're definitely of the of the same opinion, um, and. Yeah, <laughs> and, there, and, there, and there it is. And, and do you have? I mean, you're. I think your age is pertinent because you don't yet have a sense of loss. You're not looking at people your age with children, and mm. and feeling the absence or, or noting the difference. Perhaps is a nicer way of putting it. And 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 also, you can never say never, can you? You never know what attitudes may develop or what ideas may change but but to be there at 25 essentially ruling it out for the foreseeable is is new certainly wouldn't have happened in my generation not for environmental reasons not not on anything like the scale you allude to and it is i mean it's sad in many ways and profoundly admirable in others it's 11 46 james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc it is 10 to 12, listening with interest as always, says Bradley. Um, you always go back to the boomer generation for the difference in house prices. I don't, mate. I, 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 I probably have the last few times you've been listening, but I usually go back to myself 
So we got married in 2000. Not only did our mortgage cost, you know, roughly three times our income, our home cost roughly three times our income, but we got a 110% mortgage, mate. And that's going back 23 years. That's not going back to the boomers. But what I don't find, I don't find my generation ringing into the program to say, God, young people today, they could easily afford a home if they didn't eat so many avocados and if they cancelled their Netflix subscription. It's usually people 10, 15, 20, 30 years older than me who don't stop to think about how the world may have changed since they were that age or since they had children and and they're still deploying 1970s flavoured uh, opinions in a 21st century world. So, no, I take your point. And uh, you point out that in 1990, you could uh, 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 get a house for 50 grand and the average yearly wage was 25. I know, you're right. And 10 years later, you were, you were, you know, as I say, in a position where you could get a 110% mortgage on an already affordable home. By 2020, average house price 300, average wage 30. That's in 30 years. Crazy. And as Badly adds, good luck giving up those skinny flat whites in order to get a deposit together. Laura's in Portsmouth. Laura, what would you like to say? Hi, James. So I'm sort of like the last caller. I'm 26, so still pretty young. And I've made the decision not to have kids, mainly because of how messed up the world is. How do we know it's going to stay? And and I'm not suggesting for a minute that you're... I'm not patronising you by any stretch of the imagination, but I can... if, If I was your age now, I could imagine thinking what you think, but then changing my mind a couple of years later or a few years later don't know if I want to take that risk and bring a child into the world where at the minute you can't really get a doctor's appointment, you can't get a dentist appointment. Yeah. There's such long waits in A&E, you could be waiting in a corridor. And that's now the cost of living has just been getting worse and worse and worse. There's, there's adverts on how to save on your energy bill and turn the radiators off and things like that. Yeah. And I just think in 20 years time, if we struggle to get a mortgage, if we can't turn the heating on, if we're having to look at, can we afford orange juice in the supermarket today? Yes. How, how's it going to be in 20 years? I, well, I, 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 I don't want to sound like one of the people I've just been berating. <laughs> but, you know, people had kids in the war. People had kids in the I mean, when there was rationing. People had raised yeah. fam- happy, happy-ish families when there was didn't have a proverbial pot to pee in. So... What, why, There's why? also been studies that people were ha- not happier, but it was a better quality of life post-war than than we are now. Is there? Yeah. In what ways? Just in the, I, to, to be honest, maybe I'm not doubting myself, but I've read a few on that where people, it was that sense of camaraderie. You could still get housing. Council housing became a thing. This is, this the, is the social contract. This is social capital. When I was so, listening to you yesterday. I thought the same thing. And yeah, then, it is, this isn't is, it? it, it it's no longer, if you have a kid and you and your partner break up, it's not, oh, I can go to the council and I'll be rehoused. It's, you could be in a hostel, you could be somewhere really unfortunate. And you could turn if on you... your radio and hear someone attacking you for your te- te- desperate lifestyle choices. But that's, I think, been yeah. true since since Rupert Murdoch bought the sun or that, that roughly <laughs> that period of British history. So, so uh, social capital is something I only really learned about doing this job when the the because you sit here thinking well people didn't used to have that much money and they seemed better they seemed happier but they had more social capital they had access to more things including most obviously social housing so you might not own it personally it's not personal capital but it's social capital that you have a stake in and that feels lower now than it did when when i was was your age it was secure my mum's lived in a council house for 30 years managed to buy it with a 33 percent deposit from the council she was paying i think 300 pound a month rent for a massive three bedroom she worked but if god forbid something bad happened and she were to go on welfare she would still be secure in her home if something happened to me and i had to go on benefits i wouldn't be able to pay my mortgage so why would i bring a kid into that uh, well I, I leave that question hanging for anthony in southampton who I, who I don't think is being disingenuous when he says we've managed to convince young people that having children is mainly a financial consideration almost a luxury like buying a car or a house it's not and the world is messed up argument is utter rubbish the modern world is wildly better than any time in the past come on guys cheer up says anthony in southampton who i suspect is not reaching the end of the month wondering how he's going to pay 
his food bills tomorrow, despite having a job. Um, and if you are, then the idea of adding another mouth to those food bills and perhaps taking money out of what's coming in as a consequence of having to take time off work must be pertinent. It must be relevant. It, I just It's interesting. I don't think there's a black and white answer to this. And you still have people raising children in very straightened circumstances who wouldn't have done anything different for all the tea in China. But, but I, I, you look at the statistics and you say, why are these numbers falling? And you start to assemble the answers. And um, uh, for all of Anthony's rose-tinted spectacles, there are an awful lot of people who look out at the world around us and, and see bleakness. And I, I, I don't know what you do about that. Well, I know you could stop voting Tory, I suppose, for a start, <laughs> because they don't see bleakness. They just see a uh, pandemic comes along and they see a business opportunity. But, but you know, the idea of, of, of society being a thing that should be nurtured, cared for, um, that, that, I think, is ripe for a political return, shall we say. But maybe too late. Brian's in Lisbon in Northern Ireland. Brian, last word on this. What would you like to say? Hi, James. I'm... Uh I live in Northern Ireland, so the cost of living crisis, the price of houses, etc., aren't as extreme as no, they are that's true. In, in, in England. Yes. And yet, I have six children, and the three youngest, who are uh, 17, 23, and 24, worry so much about the idea of bringing children into this world. Oh, do they? Not only, not only financially, but also because of what the environment going to be like in the future. And we've had many conversations with them, and my wife and I have actually had sleepless nights worrying about our kids not being able to have as much enjoyment in life as we had. First generation they, that's happened to, I think, isn't it? The, 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 yeah. the, the, their expectations will be lower than their parents, and, and so it's likely will be their kind of um, destinations. Yeah, um, and whenever you talk to them, they say, but how come you were able, you were able to have six of us yeah. and only daddy worked? <laughs> it's a and, different and, world, isn't it? Yeah, and, and you're trying to explain to them, look, you know, initially we didn't, you know, we didn't decide not to have children. We we had children and, and uh, we had three older ones. We had a, a long break and when they got older, we thought, you know what, you know, we're missing in life, our young children. And we had another three children. But the environment is changing that much, and this cost of living crisis is getting ridiculous. And as I say, we don't we don't seem to be suffering as much in Northern Ireland as you as the people in England are suffering, because you know uh, our, our electricity is capped. You know the the, the the main suppliers are only permitted to make a one percent profit. Yes. Um, but the cost, the housing. You know, uh, my eldest daughter. You know. They had to live with us and save and save and save and his parents had a chip in and, and we had a chip in in order for them to get on the housing ladder. And we're realising now that we are going to have to remortgage our house to give the younger three children the same benefit we give the older ones. Oh, really? So that's a burden on us again. Well, I talked about that earlier. I said that, that, yeah. that it's going to impact it upwards then. It's going to turn that it's going to compromise your expectations of retirement and old age. Exactly, yeah, and you're now starting to think, hang on a minute, we've just cleared the mortgage on the house, we're going to have to now remortgage it because we feel obligated to help our children. So that's now two generations, if not three it, generations. Can I, I'll ask you a stupid question. Where's it all gone? Where's what all gone? The money? Yeah, where's it all gone? <laughs> um, thankfully, I have a pension and, and we saved it. And no, you'll, you'll, be, you'll, you'll be all right. But, well, I mean, in terms of, in, 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 I mean, where has it all gone? Well, the idea that there was enough to go around when you were getting started as a family man, when you were starting, and now there isn't for your for, for the next because, generation. Because our society has turned into a carbon copy of the American society. Yeah. Greed is good. The people who have money want more money. If you're a millionaire, you want to be a billionaire. If you're mm. a billionaire, you want to be the richest billionaire. Yeah, the only you thing we it, haven't got yet is um, trailer parks, isn't it, really? But I suppose exactly. that, that, that'll be well, next. That's the way our society is going. Look how many people are on the streets. Look how many people are in tents. That Corella well, wanted to get rid of got, We've got, yeah, I remember that, yeah. They abolished the tents. Yeah. That was a bit of a new low. And, and indeed, LBC's investigation today that you'll no doubt hear a bit more about in the looming news bulletin, looking at the amount of money that's being spent on temporary accommodation for people, which, I, I, you know, that's like dead money, isn't it? If you're spending £2 billion on homes that, that stay as part of that social capital we were talking to the earlier caller about, it's very different from giving £2 billion or whatever the figure is 
to private landlords to get richer. That's the people that Brian is talking about. It's, it's, the problem is that any conversation like this has been successfully... Uh, the people on the wrong end of it, uh, who've consumed our right-wing media for the last 30 years, hear conversations like this and, and think that somehow they're on either the right side of the inequality or that attempts to make things fairer are some form of communism. James O'Brien on LBC. It's three minutes after 12. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I think we'll have a complete change of pace now. And, it, well, I suppose in a way, but not, not completely, given that the first hour was inspired in part by TV, albeit a TV drama about a story that's been around for 20 years. I don't know if you have seen Fool Me Once yet. No spoilers. And I appreciate, for some of the reasons that we've been touching upon in the last hour, not everybody has Netflix. But it's brilliant telly. And I, I mean, Sheila Fogarty came in yesterday at about, well, at the usual time, and I just mentioned it, and she, she revealed that she'd watched the whole thing. She'd been up until 2 o'clock in the morning. Honestly. Because um, it is one of those things. You know when you're reading a book and you think, oh, just one more chapter before, and then suddenly you realise half past 2 in the morning and you've got 50 pages left, and you think, oh, well, I might as well finish it now. You plough on to the end. Well, the author with whom you are most likely to have an experience like that is, is one of them is Harlan Coben, and he is responsible for this drama on Netflix at the moment, Fool Me Once, which is, um, oh, it's just brilliant. And I, I'm only four or five episodes in, so do, don't, don't go any further on that. But I want to talk about soap operas because Michelle Keegan, the star of the show um, and the star of, of many other shows as well, not least Brassic, which doesn't get mentioned in the Daily Telegraph today because they've probably never heard of it. But that is a superb, <laughs> absolutely brilliant television programme. Um, she's talking about the snobbery. She's uh, been on Fern Cotton's podcast and d described that because soap operas are seen as traditionally working class that people perhaps look down on them and, um, and, and that there's a snobbery attached to it because it is seen as a working class art form. And, and you know I'm fascinated by class. I'm fascinated by uh, the, the history of class in this country and the damage that it does to us as a population and continues to do. Some of the issues we touched upon in the last hour are exacerbated hugely by class. People who think they know their place, they shouldn't be aspiring. They think it's perfectly normal for, for the rich man to be in his castle and the poor man to be at his gate because God made them high and lowly and ordered their estate as the song goes. Um, but I... I, I, I <laughs> I don't watch soaps anymore. I've got to be honest with you. More, I think, through current family circumstances. My mother-in-law is addicted to Coronation Street. Absolutely addicted to it. I used to be. I, I, I remember watching Vera Duckworth's Death and Jack Duckworth, Bill Tarmy, and Elizabeth Dawn being the actor and the actress. And you see, listen, I want to say something to you like, that's like watching Leah with Cordelia at the end of King Lear. Look, Cordelia is his daughter, and, 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 but, but, the, but the, for me, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not thick, right, but I'm also, I'm not unexposed to high art, right? I've been around the block a few times. I've seen some incredible shows, and I, and I know my way around Chekhov and Shakespeare and yada, yada, boom, and the rest of it. I've read the Russians, darling. I've read the Russians. And I, and I know what happened. So I think of a couple of moments from watching High Art. Uh, I saw Branner's Lear recently. It, for my money, wasn't as good as Glenda Jackson's, which was probably the late Glenda Jackson's, which was probably the one that I saw before. But that there are moments in Lear and in Hamlet that that, that tear the heart out of you, right? That they they get you in a way that is almost impossible to convey. And when he uses, does he use, he uses the mirror, doesn't he, to see whether or not she's breathing at the end. And it just, it just destroys you. Or other, I think Lear is the play for me, actually. So, like, oh, fool, I shall go mad. The, 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 the disintegration of this mighty human being is, is quite incredible. So that's probably out of all the plays I've seen and all the productions I've seen, it's probably Lear that, that reaches the parts other shows cannot reach. And then you've got, um, I'm trying to think of other things like cinema, like really powerful cinema. You'd go for a Scorsese, wouldn't you? Probably, or a, um, a, 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 a Merchant Ivory, or, or whatever it may be. 
and cinema can affect you in ways. If the Lindsay Anderson film, if is something that I watch at least twice a year, it's a film that just gets to me in ways. Books, then you've got books that you reread, whether it's Dostoevsky or Jane Austen or J.D. Salinger or whatever it may be. I, I've never fully understood, for all the money that my mum and dad spent on my education, I've never fully understood the difference between high art and popular art. I certainly think that a a John le Carre novel or a Mick Heron novel is literature. There's a there's a debate, isn't there, in in literary circles about genre fiction. If it's genre fiction, in other words, if it has a plot, if it has a really tight plot, then it's not as good as a book that is less focused. On, on events and, and is more about character. I don't, I've never bought that. I've never really thought that because, for example, a murder gets solved in the course of a novel, it is somehow artistically inferior to a novel in which nothing much happens. Although I suppose now you have to mention Waiting for Godot, don't you? Which is famously a play in which absolutely nothing happens and is about, about as high as high art went in the 20th century. So... I, I, I'm not a thicko, and I am not a philistine, and I'm not a snob either. But I honestly believe that there are moments, I'm, and I'm going with, with Vera Duckworth's death, when, when Jack Duckworth found, and I could pick a few other things as well, but I'm going back to my heyday as a soap watcher. I am not remotely embarrassed to say to you that I think that was as powerful in terms of writing, acting, and emotional impact as anything that I've seen on stage in the West End or in Stratford or in films directed by anybody from Christopher Nolan right through to Martin Scorsese. That, and, and it happens a lot in soaps. It happened that there have been other moments in soaps where the acting, the writing, and the filming have conspired to deliver a moment of absolute artistic magnificence. Right? It's not like watching American soaps where, uh, you know, the, 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 the set wobbles or the delivery is really wooden. It's why Joey Tribbiani's character in Friends Ending Up in Days of Our Lives was so funny. I think it's often been said that if Charles Dickens was alive today, he'd be writing for EastEnders. I think there's some truth in that. He'd be better off writing novels. I think there's more money in it. But the, the snobbery that Michelle Keegan speaks of, I think, is undeniable it's seen as working class people look down on it and yet dickens writes largely about the working class well not large but but a lot of what he writes is about the working class um why why are soaps why is there snobbery around soap operas think about it oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three and then tell me why, why is there snobbery around soap operas I interviewed Stephanie Beecham yesterday. She's lovely. Uh, what an amazing woman. Um, uh, and of course, she's been in the, the Colbys and Dynasty in America, but also a stage actress of, of, of immense experience and talent. And uh, to be fair, before I sat down to swat up on her before conducting the interview, I hadn't known the full extent of her, of her stage work because she was so um, associated with the... America, the heyday of American shoulder pad soap operas, but they had great acting in them as well. Stephanie Beecham is a supreme actress, a superlative actress. If you saw Tenko, if you're anything close to my age, then, then, then you'll know that. But there is a snobbery surrounding soaps. You could take the best actor in the world and stick them in a soap. Didn't Ian McKellen pop up in Coronation Street at one point? Didn't he? I think he did. So why? That's the question I've got for you. Why? Is there snobbery surrounding soap operas? Why does does why do soap operas have snobbery? And if you're even close to the industry, if you're even close to the business, when I say to you that I have watched soap opera, Coronation Street in particular, because that was my favourite growing up, but the, the 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 idea that the quality of acting and the quality of writing, the quality of filming and directing, is in any way inferior to theater or film or higher perceived higher i think that is absolutely ridiculous and yet when a star like michelle keegan who, who's come off the back of coronation street and gone on to 
um, become an international star now, the lead character in an international thriller that, that, that this new crime drama Fool Me Once. And it's only the latest step in her astonishing career. She's like sort of Saran Jones, isn't she? Um, they're quite similar actresses, actually, and, and very similar background, both of, of Coronation Street. But this idea of the snot, I just want to explore it. That's all. I want to explore the idea that there is still a snobbery surrounding one of the finest uh, production lines for, for dramatic talent in this country. Anna Friel came off the back of Brookside as well. Jenna Coleman uh, was in Emmerdale, wasn't she, before, before she did Doctor Who, and now she's in Hollywood doing things like Captain America. So wh why, just why the snobbery? And also, remember, I'm a bit out of the loop. Oh, yes, the double header with Doc Cotton and Ethel. I did watch that, actually, on EastEnders. Well, she's a brilliant example, actually. Um, June, June, June Brown, the actress who played Doc Cotton. She, she was, because occasionally you'll put on an old film from the 1950s or 60s, and she'll pop up in it. And she, so, so they have astonishing, and the mum, the woman who played the grand, the, 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 the uh, flipping it, Pete and Pauline's mum. Anna Neagle, she'd, she'd, she'd done it all as well. So you see these actors and actresses of impeccable pedigree delivering absolutely incredible performances. And yet in 2024, when the latest wonderful example of just how good you have to be to thrive, Michelle Keegan's pulling in 10 million viewers, topping Netflix most watched programs list in more than 60 countries. And she describes the snobbishness that surrounds her apprenticeship on a soap opera. Why? Why? Is it, does it speak of insecurity on the part? Do I sound stupid to you when I say that Vera's death in Coronation Street was every bit as powerful to me as Cordelia's death in a good production of King Lear? Or, or do you go, yeah, you're right, actually, but I don't know if I'd say that at my next dinner party. 0345 606 Sarah Lancashire, another wonderful example. That you've got to be brilliant to keep those to keep all of those different plots alive, all of those different relationships. I, I, I mean, I used to do a bit of acting. I probably mentioned that to you on a couple of occasions because there is a frustrated, frustrated despian somewhere inside me, and 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 that must be the. It's like doing rep in the old days. You're doing a different thing, a different scene. I know you're playing the same character. All of the things I've just said should make it an absolute nonsense. Anna Wing, sorry, not Anna Neagle. An absolute nonsense that even now a 34-year-old actress on the absolute top of her game has to describe the snobbery that surrounds the genre, 36-year-old actress, that surrounds the snobbery that surrounds the, the, the context in which she started playing Tina, wasn't it, in Corrie. What... What's that about? Why is there still snobbery? 0345 6060 973. Hit the numbers now. You will get through. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 19 minutes after 12. I forgot to give you the uh, the other smear, Keir. Have we got a sound effect yet, Keith? No, I'm told Chris Moores gets his within 15 to 20 minutes of asking for them over on Radio X. No, I must. I owe him twenty quid. Actually, I must pay him back. He, he, he dug me out of a hole yesterday. I think he may have talked about it on air and alluded to the fact that I looked like someone who could be found um, begging on the streets of London, which I thought was a little unkind. I, I, although, to be fair to Chris, he's, he's very well groomed, and I am not. But I thought that was possibly a little bit, a little bit excessive. But anyway, the, the latest smear here. So, how many is on the list now? We've got four things, four or five things on the list. So, they, he was asked what his favourite piece of music is that best sums up his Labour Party, and he recalled being um, a young lawyer, just just sort of starting out in in his business, just out of university. He said, "I've just got my feet under the desk as a lawyer. I had my whole life ahead of me, and the Berlin Wall came down." There was an incredible feeling of freedom, of change in my life. Things were going to be fundamentally different. And the piece of music associated with the fall of the Berlin Wall was Beethoven's Ode to Joy. So for him, that is the song most connected with that sense of a brighter future. He said, you've got the orchestra, you've got the voices, you've got this big combination. And that is what he wants his Labour Party to feel like. Um, making meaningful change, cooperation, combination, a brighter future. He said, this is very sort of Labour. Um, uh, 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 I mean, fairly, you'd have thought a fairly uncontroversial 
um, description of why a certain piece of music is emblematic of uh, what he wants his political movement to be. It was blasted out in Tiananmen Square, I think, by the demonstrators when they were protesting against oppression in China. It's a, a timeless piece of music, but no. When he revealed that he liked the um, Ode to Joy, which is one of the most popular pieces of music on Desert Island Discs, by the way, some Conservatives argued the choice of music signals Keir Starmer's pro-EU leanings. This is how desperate Smear Keir has become uh, someone called Richard Holden who I think is chairman of the Conservative Party or was what a piece of classic music is is Keir Starmer's favorite choose any in the world a Wesleyan hymn some rousing Elgar a modern American classic a slice of Wagnerian Wagnerian opera and he alights on the EU anthem Richard Holden not previously suspected of having particularly um, uh, scrupulous musical tastes describes Beethoven's one of Beethoven's most famous pieces as simultaneously totally naff and completely telling. Of course compared to David Frost he who negotiated the Brexit withdrawal uh, Richard Holden is close to a genius. Uh, David Frost contributed to the conversation by saying one must suspect Starmer of making a pro EU political point because he likes some Beethoven so that's another one for Smear Keir so now we've got the donkeys the curry the ode to joy what else there's t the donkeys the curry the ode to joy the being a lawyer and the working for nothing to abolish the death penalty five things that client journalists and stupid Tories have tried to turn into negatives for Keir Starmer and the sooner we get our Smear Keir uh Sound effect or jingle? What do we call it? Is it a jingle? What's the word for it? What? Stab. Yeah, a stab. A, st a smear keer stab. And the sooner I can get on with the business of forgetting all about the feature and never doing it again. Alicia is in Chiswick to talk about snobbery in soap operas. What would you like to say, Alicia? Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm a bit, a bit nervous. Why? Um, it's only me. <laughs> Well, hi, yeah, I know. I've been listening to you for twenty years, so Gosh. always. Is it twenty? We should have a, we should have some sort of commemoration, shouldn't we? I, I, I mean, see if maybe get Rusty yeah, Lee to record get, to record me a message. Phone. Rusty Lee could record me a message. Anyway, I digress. What what, what would you like to say? <laughs> well, Barry from EastEnders. Well, Barry from um, EastEnders. Yes, exactly. Topical. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think it's it's two things. I think it's partly a bit of a a bit of a class snobbery, and mm. um, the, the the feed into. Um, into the sort of what are seen as more high art tend to be people that went to university and then went to drama school. So okay. they may have gone to Eton and then into or, or, got, or read English at Oxford and then gone to drama school. You look, look people like Red, Eddie Redmayne and that sort of thing. But the feed into so. uh, soap tends to be a little bit more down to earth. You get a lot of like, especially if they're going in as younger kids and they tend yeah. to be in set in more working class backgrounds. So you'll get a lot of the local drama schools in in the north that will be the feed of the actors into into soaps like coronation street so i think that, that is partly it but i also think the other side of it is um the speed that the art form is executed i think within the industry people tend to think well you know the scripts are knocked uh, out in okay yes factory churn way and the the you know it's multi it's filmed with multi-camera so you know the quality isn't perhaps so good they don't have time to sort of luxuriate in creating high art like they do in film so i think there's a bit of both but the the one the one thing that really interests me the most is the fact that we do have this massive snobbery within within the industry and like sections of the industry like hannah Waterman talks about it all the time about the fact that she was in musical theater for years who does get um, Hannah Waddingham, who's... Oh, no, I know who she Ted, is. Yes, Ted no, she's, she's, yeah. she, Ted Lasso has been a game-changer yeah. for her, but she felt she wouldn't get seen for roles because she was associated with with West End musicals, so she wouldn't get exactly. seen for proper dramas or big TV and film jobs. And then she smashed it out of the park in Ted Lasso, didn't she? Yeah, and she's really sent the list back down. Like She talks about it constantly, and she's mm. like, you know, people, the snobbery within the industry for, of actors being pigeonholed into different areas, like soaps or musical theatre, needs to stop, because actually people like Michelle Keegan, Saran Jones, like you've got these incredible talents that were just sort of put in that soapbox for years, so it's the industry that does it more than the more than the 
audience then? Because it yeah, prob- I absolutely think it's industry. Ah. I don't think it's anything to do with the viewing public at all. Uh, I think they're much more, in fact, pr- pretty excited by people like Saran Jones and yes. Hannah Wasserman, you know, that get a big opportunity and suddenly end up in Game of Thrones or Ted Lasso. Or I, I, I would have thought if you didn't have what it takes, it'd be a lot easier to hide on a on a West End stage than it would be on a soap opera. You've got the camera oh, right well, in your face. and, and you... Well, yeah, I mean, it depends what you mean by what it takes. I mean, a musical theatre is so like multifaceted. You've yes. got to be pretty good at all three things. You don't necessarily have to change the world with your acting, but you have to be adept. Whereas, I guess, yeah, in soaps, it's just acting. That's all it is. That's that's your one job. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I didn't mean that. I meant a Western stage for a straight play, not for a musical play. I'm just trying to think where you're more likely to be found out if you're not a very good actor. I would have thought a soap opera would be among the most exacting contexts imaginable for for somebody who's just not very good. You just you wouldn't well, you wouldn't get past day one, would you? Well, I mm, I have no. no idea. <laughs> All right, well, don't name any names. I don't want to upset anybody, but I can't no, remember I seeing don't. a bad actor in a soap opera. I mean, it's, I, well, mean uh, I, I think I don't mean El Dorado, people, obviously. I mean like the really big established <laughs> ones. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's some people that are quite clearly stand out, and other people okay, that that's are, true. are competent and maybe extremely suited to their role. But see, and then I always think of Bill Roach as well because I'm talking to Stephanie oh, yeah. Beecham yesterday about he's been playing the same part for sixty years, and they're of a similar, I think, a similar generation. And she's done it; she's done the West End, and she's gone off to Hollywood, and she's come back, and she's got films coming out. And and yet, in some ways, his performance albeit the same character for 60 years is 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 epic i mean truly epic and yet the the idea that he should be lauded in the same way that a that an ian mckellen is or a or a branner um most people would find absurd i don't find it absurd but to, to be that good for that long is quite quite extraordinary um thank you alicia lee is in preston lee what would you like to say Good afternoon, James. Um, yeah, I'm a TV extra, or as we say these days, I'm a supporting artist. Um, so I get to work on um, the Northwest soaps quite a lot, um, Hollyoaks on Coronation Street. And I think the problem with the snobbery you speak of, I think it's probably because they're, they're, they're on so often and it's like a complacency thing with people. So, they just so it must be market. easy because it's on all the time, sort of kind thing. Of, kind of, yeah. But at the same time, if you look at the kind of view figures they get, compared to uh, a lot of other stuff they do really well and working on them um quite uh, quite often um doing my job is that i, I sometimes sit there in awe of, of the speed they turn it turn the, the scenes and the shots around that it's incredible because it's on so often obviously they have to they have to be in and out with stuff um but i do think it's a complacency thing with with the general public well, I, yeah, I've been mean, thinking about what Alicia said. More of the snobbery comes from within the industry than without, which probably makes sense. But the public are thinking, well, this can't be, uh, this can't be as good as a Hollywood film because because it's on four nights a week. Yeah, I just think, uh, I, think yeah, that is, I think that's I think that's I think that's part of it. Um, if some of these one-off dramas um, were were on permanently, people would start to feel the same about them. They just you, it's just a natural human human reaction. If something's on a lot, then you sort of think, oh well, you know, it's. When when you're it's on set, what which ones did yeah. you say you'd be, you'd you'd been in the background on? Um, I've been working on Hollywoods for okay. um, a long time, and I'm a Coronation Street uh, quite a lot as well. So when when you're on set, uh, uh, do you have moments of magic? Do you, do you have where, like some actors can deliver stuff that other actors can't? That there'll be there'll be people. So for example, I'm thinking of for perhaps Saran Jones or Michelle Keegan, where because I'm going to fall into the trap now, but it's not snobbery, this. This is just a hierarchy of talent where, where some of them, even among a brilliant cast on a brilliant show that's been running for a million years, every now and then an actor comes along who, who just just stands an inch or two above everybody else. Yeah, you you, you always get that. I mean, there's brilliant actors on, um, you know, I'm, I'm not just saying this because I'm on national no. radio, but there's brilliant actors on, on everything. And then... Sometimes you'll just see, like I worked on the, um, I worked on the um, Reese Jones drama. Yes, um, gosh. I, I was on, I was on the, um, I was on the jury for that. Um, right. In fact, I delivered the verdicts. Did and you? When I was on, <laughs> when I was, when I was on that, I actually 
genuinely there was no acting required because you know we, we film our shots in one go so they'll all film the 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 the, 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 the cast parts and then they'll kind of film all right, of it, got in, it. In, one, yes. in one go so there was no acting required i had tears in my eyes listening to it because obviously i'm from that part yeah. of the world and so but yeah you, you you'll just see some some gems and you just think wow and you, you literally want to stand up and clap because the performance is so good and even if they'll do it that you know um they'll do you'll do obviously several takes sometimes and it Every time you just think, wow, that is a special skill. And the difference with the theatre, obviously, is I think there's a lot of actors who, who, who prefer one over the other. A lot of them like the instantaneous, of uh, you know, the instant reaction of a live audience. Mm. And mm. you don't have the endless retaking of shots. But I'm not sure I agree with the, I think, what you said previously. Because I think in theatre, you have to nail it in one go in a soap. You can go again. It's not that often, but I, but yeah, I I, I mean, you, you kind of do, I, I I guess. I mean, people don't. They can come back again and do it the next night. But you're right. It's I oddly drawing on my tiny experience in even remotely related fields. I find pre-records harder than live, actually, Lee, because you have that subconscious notion in the back of your mind that if it goes wrong, you can stop and do it again. Whereas if it's live, something happens. Something kicks in, and I've only done, I've presented live television programs and recorded television programs. Um, something happens. I haven't done really pre recorded radio. I suppose podcasts fit into it, but something different happens. So you're doing auto cue, and you know that if you make a mistake, you can stop and do it again. So you do. So you say, oh, sorry, can I do that again? If you're live doing auto cue and you're about to stumble or you're halfway through stumbling, you swallow the stumble and you crack on and pretend that nothing's gone wrong. So, so it's just different, different. So I think we can, we can, I'll give you 52, 48% on that one, Lee. 12.32, Amelia Cox has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.35 is the time. I, this is really interesting. I hadn't thought of it coming from the inside. Uh, of the industry as opposed to the outside um, and a text to mention because I did I'm a bit sniffy about El Dorado a minute ago only because it's a byword for ill-fated soap operas you have to be of a certain age but you're right um, I think Jane Horrocks was in it Jesse Birdsall was in it he was um, crikey my memory's a funny old place he was Markush uh, he's a brilliant actor uh, he, he was in um Wish You Were Here, the Emily Lloyd breakthrough film as well. So the snobbery regarding soaps coming from within the industry rather than without is probably the point Michelle Keegan was making because I don't think it is extraordinary for an audience member to say I was as moved by that as I was by that supposedly moment, that moment of supposedly high art. This is interesting from Ben who works uh, in the industry on, on, on documentaries, a founder of a company called Ben and Jack Studio for, for the shameless plug he writes. Um, he says from the technical side, he's a director of photography, he says from the technical side of things, it's very easy to look down your nose at soap because it simply doesn't look as high-end as cinema. There's lef- less effort when capturing pictures. If the soap operas were lit slightly differently and they used cinema cameras, I think we would start to see a lot more respect for soap and TV as a whole. It's similar to someone taking a photo of the same thing with a really good camera or an iPhone. The really good camera will always get more praise, even though the picture's exactly the same. I think much of the snobbery comes from people within the entertainment industry itself. Um, And I knew, sorry, I should have made it clearer, I I knew that Stephanie Beecham had been in Coronation Street as Ken Barlow's love interest. I just thought she was a really good example of of someone who's done absolutely everything. Uh, 12.37 is the time. Jade's in Bermondsey. Jade, what would you like to say? Um, I just wanted to kind of jump on board with with kind of the comments that have come already. That's a really good point just made by Ben as well in regards to like quality of camera and, yeah, and how the so. picture makes a massive difference on what people's perception of the quality is. I guess for me, I've um, I've been acting since about 2012 um, and I haven't been on a soap but right. would love to be on one um, but it's always been kind of a get in for a lot of actors writers directors it's been kind of like the first well I say the first but it's been like the first big break for a lot of people I mean doctors obviously that's just yeah. finished but that was always uh, for me especially as well that you know all the actors that are and the bill are was a soap in a way but, wasn't it as well say that again the bill me? the bill was a soap bill, in many yeah, ways yeah that's supposed to be coming back apparently but um, yeah. yeah the they, for me, like I guess I've got a couple of friends that write for EastEnders, and 
um, I've just seen like this massive like push behind like the quality and the recognition that soaps are starting to get, especially EastEnders this year in the in the soap awards. They they you know they swept up so many awards and and the effort and the quality of the writers and directors that are coming in are incredible and the performances like honestly they really are. But I, I think this snobbery has got something to do with a little bit about like some storylines and this you know this concept of like this poverty porn like idea of people having these storylines that always could only happen to the lower classes and okay i i think there's something to do with that but from 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 my perspective i've seen the industry changing massively in regards to a call out for working class artists across well, it's all getting better it's getting better. I, okay. I would definitely say that, but it's definitely industry related. I think audiences are watching, and appreciating art for what it is. But I think that there's been such a a gap between you know who can and stay stay within the industry. You know, it takes a lot to be able to remain in in well, the industry. It, you know, and I mean, in order to be able to support yourself and be available for auditions or and be available to get your scripts in and written and stuff. So I think there's um I think there's obviously a long way to go, but I think there's massive changes that are happening. I mean, just yesterday, like I, as I say, I'm an actor, but um, there's there's call outs for, for people to write scripts for TV that are from a lower social economical background oh, because really? there, yeah there is I mean for authenticity for authenticity absolutely Stephen Graham um, and his wife have, 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 they you know they put together Matriarch Productions which is calling out for more working class voices and more scripts for TV um, so they've got you know like grassroots prizes and stuff so there's loads of there's loads of opportunities and call outs for the working class voices in TV it goes in but cycles just, doesn't it I, I, I think you know until the 1950s 60s it was all people carrying tennis rackets stepping through the <laughs> patio doors on the West End stage and then that generation of sort of Albert Finney Mm. And, and Peter O'Toole came along, and, and yep. Tom Courtney, I suppose, most obviously. But they, that was bringing northern accents into the middle of it. I suppose that the, the Cockney, the southeastern accent, is it, it has not been part of that cycle in a way. And so, soaps have delivered it. Soaps have, have, have yeah. what have made it commonplace and normal on screen and on stage. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And there's this, this kind of stigma to an actor that goes into a soap and maybe doesn't move out of that soap. You know, that they're only ever known for that that role I find that fascinating though I, I, weird, I find yeah. that fascinating because you can imagine I had a mate who was in a West End show for nine months and and turned down the chance to stay in it because he wanted to do other stuff and and he probably regrets it a bit now it was a long time mm. ago but mm. the, the the idea that you'll do something for 10 years or 20 it takes some guts I imagine to to, to yeah. walk away from it and oh my gosh think that and to walk away from the wage you know to Kenny's walk away just, from that stability. I, I used to know Kenny Doughty who was um Vera's sidekick in Vera until the last end of the last series until the until mm. the and, and he he's I've read an interview with him where he says he just fancies doing some other stuff. It takes some real stones that to to give up a brilliant job that people really love and that you're superb at because you quite fancy doing something else. But I get it. If you're an actor, you probably dream of playing other roles, not not one role forever. Which is why the Stephanie Beecham, um, Bill Roach love affair on Corrie was so fascinating. Off the, the off set ramifications of it the off-screen ramifications what it said about acting and actors thank you jade luke's in plymouth luke what would you like to say hello james first time caller welcome um how are you very well, well mate nice what's on your mind you. likewise so yeah so there are i'm going to give you two more names of famous people from soaps but they're from our antipodean well uh, let columns. me guess what so, you're going to say shall i guy pierce and, and chris well, hemsworth yeah guy pierce is one yes uh, no i was actually going to say russell crowe russell crowe chris hemsworth yeah margot mm-hmm. robbie Yep, all people we've been through sort of soap opera sort yeah, of system. Yeah, and now they're there. all Hollywood, baby. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. So where does uh, the snobbery come from? Do you think? Yeah, I think in part it, it's. I, I think there is always television's always until recently been the lower cousin yes. of film. If you, it was only sort of in the last ten years that I think the television has really taken off and is considered art. I mean, in the last ten years, you've had. Did we mention his name, Kevin Spacey, but Steve Buscemi, Glenn Close, doing all of those people sets, who are... Doing the Netflix you know, specials and, and having the same impact as a, as a cinematic release film. Yeah, and I also think, uh, you know, I was, you know, sort of mirror some of the previous callers' view that I think not only is there a, an ease of access and a cost to that, I mean, when you yes. go to see King Lear, how much does it cost you? You know, yes. 50, 60 pounds, perhaps. Mate, and the, when's the last time you went out well, in the West End and the rest? <laughs> 
Well, last time I went out was a few years ago. Yeah, yeah but some of the tickets the ticket for the Brannard, Leo, yeah. they get hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Yeah. I went on Where press is, night, but a, I, I yeah. don't know if I could have justified it otherwise. It's, I mean, it's a great, great production, but crikey. Um, yeah. So so it is Where because is, it's free and it's relatively disposable and it's a bit like fish and chip paper, isn't it? The dramatic equivalent of, of something else will be along tomorrow. It has a a disposable kind of feel to it. But, but the bottom line is that some of the acting and the writing that you see is absolutely superlative. Thank you. I'm cracking on, Luke, only so I can squeeze in one more call before the break, and it's Mary in Bognor Regis. Mary, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello. Delighted to talk to you. I've been a fan ever since living in England. Thank you. Um, I wrote for 20 years for a four times a week soap in Dublin called Fair City. Yes. I think part of the snobbery, and I agree with everything that's been said so far, and it does come from within the industry, um, I think it comes in relation to writing from the fact that you simply have so many writers, some of them doing quite different things. Yes. Um, for instance, we would have a story team, a story room, um, and lots of people would be throwing in ideas for stories, and then those stories would be hammered out bit by bit. And the writer who actually wrote the script might or might not have been someone who was on the story team. It could have been someone else. Okay. So there is the sense that it's a kind of a factory. That, yeah, um, I was about to say it's a production line rather than a rather than a consequence of inspiration and artistic sort of. But but it, you wouldn't know that as a viewer, though, would you? Deny that there isn't inspiration. I think there's a lot of inspiration. Sometimes the person well, would it must be. It's just one idea. Yes. And then it would be hammered out into a really, really strong story. And remember that in soap, you have in each episode you have four, or five, or six different strands of story. Six, per I mean, it's a real discipline, isn't it? It's a unique discipline, really. It is a unique discipline, and I think the snobbery around it absolutely disgusts me because yes. I, that stories that are told in any of the soaps are just as strong, you know, about dysfunctional families, crime, comedy. Oh, and, and it touches on some social issues of huge importance. So it takes us back to where the show started today, was just sometimes it takes drama to draw proper levels of attention to an issue that journalism can't quite, can't quite achieve. You'll like this, Mary. Uh, it boils my blood, James, when in a quiz show, the contestant rolls their eyes with a little smirk when they realise that the question's about a soap, as if to say, oh, well, I couldn't possibly know this. I'm sure that they pass or deliberately get the answer wrong to throw their mates off the scent of them having a sneaky peek at Corey or Fair City if you're watching in Ireland. Thank you Mary it's 12.46. James O'Brien on LBC James O'Brien on LBC 12.49 is the time. I thought I had a scoopette for you next. A, a little bit of an exclusive, but Jamie Oliver's beaten me to it. Thank you so much, he's just tweeted, Mr Mayor, for extending free school meals across London for another year. Now every child in the city, whatever their circumstances, will have access to nutritious food, helping them to thrive. It takes real courage writes Jamie Oliver, to stand alone and blaze a trail, and Sadiq's bold, brilliant move should be a wake-up call for anyone who is committed to a brighter, healthier future for our kids. This needs to be rolled out across the country. Let's make that happen. Um, Sadiq Khan is on the line. You're never going to get a better introduction than that, are you? No, I'm thrilled to be able to make the announcement so that we're extending our offer of a universal free school meals to every single child in our great city for another year. So it'll go forward to at least the middle of 2025. And it's really important. I'm at Torridon Primary School in Lewisham, and I've met some of the children benefiting from our free school meals, but also the teachers who are telling me, and they, they, they're experiencing every day improved concentration, children doing better in their schools. But some of the stories I've heard from the head teachers about parents being tearful, saying, you know, I can now afford to spend a bit more on something else because I know my son or daughter is going to get a free school meal. So that packed lunch I'd pay for, I don't need to worry about. And it's just really important we recognise this is a policy that helps our children, helps our teachers, but also helps uh, productivity in our families as well. Have you been buying scratch cards, Mr Mayor? Because you found money for the tube strikers and now you've found money for free school meals. Well, it's about prioritising things that are really important for our city. If, if things had worked differently... You and I would be talking today or on Tuesday about the consequences of uh, our choose being on strike on the first proper week back after the uh, new year. I think the way to resolve disputes is by talking and negotiations. I, I don't think it's a sign of virility uh, to walk out on discussions. And so, unlike the government, the junior doctors, 
I will talk to trade unions and transport workers who, by the way, you and I held as heroes mm. during the uh, pandemic. And, you know, it is a priority for me to make sure every child in our city can eat a decent meal, but also avoid the stigma that I felt, James, when I was in that separate queue for a free school meal dinner token. Yes, it was a great school meal, uh, but I, was, I still remember that feeling of embarrassment, that feeling of my mates were in, over there, and I was over here because I had a, I had a free school meals token. And the only way to avoid that is, is to give it to everybody. It, 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 I mean, can I say, I mean, I, over the course of the last few days, unfortunately, I mean, she, she's doing fine, but I've had to go to the hospital with my mum who's been admitted. I'm sorry. Can you imagine if I was asked by the doctor at A&E, uh, you know, by the way, how much does your mum earn? Or when the ambulance came from my mum's home, how much does she earn? Or now that she's in hospital and she's having a free meal, how much does she earn? The same applies in our schools. Why are we asking our kids who are forced to go to schools how much do your parents earn? And you know you've got to earn less than £7,400 after taxes to be eligible. So we know there are many kids in our city who are in families that are in poverty who can't afford a school meal, can't afford a decent pack lunch. So their parents are stressed, their parents are anxious, they're making difficult choices, financially struggling, and the kids are having meals that aren't nutritional uh, and not doing as well. You have created, in a sense, a rod for your own back. Were you to win another term as mayor, this is something that's going to be almost impossible to row back from, isn't it? Well, one of the things I'm trying to do is, because it's a universal provision, trying to buy in the support of everyone. Uh, one of the problems with means testing certain things, I understand when there's finite resources, mm. you've got to do so. We've got to explain the benefits of a free school meal, just like you and I would argue about the benefits of free healthcare, the benefits of pensions uh, for all, and there are other examples you and I can both uh, give. When you have a fire, you don't have to give to the fire service what your income is. I think we should be making the case for universalism, particularly when it comes to provision of free school meals for our kids in primary schools. Um, uh, we move on to less happy territory, as, as, as you must surely have expected. Two fatal stabbings in London in the last uh, 12 or so hours. Uh, a man in his 20s killed at Strawberry Hill Station just before midnight. Another man found dead on the Old Kent Road just before 7.30 this morning. It, it might be a new year, Sadiq Khan, but it's the same old grim story on the streets of London. Yes, it's, it's heartbreaking. I, I, need, I, I need too many brief families both as the mayor and previously as a member of uh, uh, parliament. So what we have is all police officers now patrolling neighbourhoods where we know there has been in the past high levels of violence and uh, knife crime, but also giving young people constructive things uh, uh, to do. Unfortunately, we've got old older women who've been victims of knife crime over the last uh, week or so. And we are making progress in relation to those below the age of 25 who are the victims of knife injury. We are making progress in reducing homicides, gun crime and burglaries. What we desperately need is to make sure a young person or anybody who leaves home with a knife understands they're less likely to be more safe and more likely to risk of themselves and others as well. And that's why I support Idris Elba's campaign. And what Idris Elba is doing is bringing attention across the country about the consequences of knife crime, and I fully support him. Uh, and yet you've had two terms pretty much now to do exactly the same, and it's fair to say it hasn't worked. Well, no, we have seen a reduction of homicides. Yeah, but you haven't activity. persuaded young people on anything like the scale that's necessary that leaving home with a knife, in your own words, makes them less safe. Otherwise, Idris Elba's um, uh, campaign wouldn't be so necessary, would it? Well, his campaign is nationwide, but oh, in I London, we've seen... That. But so, London, London yeah. is, is the hot spot for this kind of crime, partly because of population concentration. Well, well actually, you know, per 100,000, actually, in London, we've got less knife crime than other parts of the country, but that's a by-the-by. One knife crime is one knife crime uh, too many. So since 2019, when we set up the country's first violence reduction unit, we have seen since 2019 a reduction in you know things like robbery, knife crime, injury below 25, uh, homicide, uh, and other things. Not enough. We need to make more progress. I'm afraid there are consequences when you have £1.1 billion less money going to the police. There are consequences when you close more than 130 youth clubs, more than 700 youth workers lose their jobs. I'm trying my best to fill the massive hole left by government cuts, but campaigns like the one from Idris Elba help because they remind Parliament of the loopholes in relation to legislation around zombie knives and knives, but also persuade the government, I hope, to invest more in being tough on crime and its causes. 
Um, speaking of investment, we've got an exclusive report today on LBC that London councils are spending 25% more on temporarily housing families on, on the sort of brink of homelessness. Westminster Council forecasting an overall spend of £90 million this year. Is this another one of those areas where, where the mayor has no agency, where the mayor has no power, or, or is it something that you, you, you can address and help with? So it's a yes and no answer. So yes, we could do stuff to help. We have more support in relation to funding to build new council homes. We are responsible for allocating some of the money that the government gives us. Uh, we've allocated all that, and that's why we're breaking records in relation to working with councils to build new council homes. But I'm afraid the supply of new homes is desperately below the demand. Uh, and so the huge bills that councils are paying in temporary accommodation is because you have more and more people uh, you know, who are homeless, statutory homeless, more and more overcrowding. Uh, the homes that are being built for sale are not affordable, they're out of reach for those sorts of families. That's why we need homes that are affordable to Londoners, and that's either council homes, genuinely affordable homes for purchase and for uh, rent. So we do what we can in relation to supporting councils, supporting developers, building more genuinely affordable homes. But with more resources, we could do even more. In the meantime, though, James, what the government can do is step in and fix the private rental market, improving the quality of the private rental market homes, freezing rents in uh, London, but also giving me the powers to work with developers and tenants to bring in rent controls. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, finally, the uh, money for the RMT members. I know that you've got negotiations, uh, or rather the ASLEF about balloting again. We'll talk about that, no doubt, next time you're in the studio, which I think is a week tomorrow. But I, I, I'm just wondering, with, with the money that you found for tube staff and the money that you found for school dinners, is, is this proof that ULES is something of a, whether intentionally or not, ULES is a bit of a cash cow for you? Yeah, none of, none of this money that we've announced is from the ULIS money. So we've, we've, we've uh, had money coming from business rates. Uh, we've had a really good recovery uh, at last year. We've had some money in reserves. So I'm using the business rates, business rates money in relation to supporting children to receive free school uh, meals. This is the time of year when we set our budget for uh, next year. Uh, ACAS discussions broke down on Friday. I'm well aware of the consequences of a week of industrial action on the underground, which is why over the weekend I stepped in. I'm really hoping we can resolve these disputes with RMT, ASLEF, uh, TSSA and uh, UNITE. It's incredibly important. Uh, we do what we can to make sure public transport carries on running because that will help the recovery of our city post the pandemic. Sadiq Khan, many thanks. And, and thank you, actually. I, I, I know I give you a hard time. It's my job. But the, but the school dinner stuff is just, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And it's an important thing. No, thank you. And happy new year to you and your well, and, as well. And love to your mum as well. I hope, she's, I hope yeah. she's back in action soon. It, it's just gone 12.59. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back to the whole show podcast on Global Player, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. You'll find all of LBC shows there to catch up on, as well as uh, all the latest news from LBC. So pause and rewind live radio on Global Player where you're always in control. Download it for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now it's time for Sheila Focus. A little little burp before you said my name. It was, it was yeah. pause for effect. It wasn't a burp. <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, listen, I really enjoyed that last hour. Good. I very much enjoyed it. Do you watch? Um, I, and I don't watch soaps anymore. I'm not sure why, really. I'm nothing no. against them. I just Routine. don't. Um, but I, I meant to say um, that... Did, did at any point, because I didn't listen to it fully, at any point did anyone talk about the scene when Hilda Ogden came back after Stan oh, had died no, that, in that, Coronation no. Street? I talked about when that Jack, Jack found Vera. Oh, yeah, similar. That was a rerun back. of a similar thing it, it in a was, way. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. But you're right. That, oh, that, it was something she, else. Jean Alexander was an extraordinary yeah, actress. Really but again, was. someone who, who spent 50 years or so playing the same part. Yeah. Incredible. Did it well. Did mm. it well. It was a really interesting hour. James O'Brien on LBC.